uh, welcome back to uh, History 103. And uh, this environment here that I find myself in is actually quite incongruous with my efforts to teach this class. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, I'm in the classroom that we used one day. We came over here, we migrated over here one morning, I think it was actually last week, for purposes of watching various YouTube videos, which are going to showcase the theatrical release trailers for Gladiator and 300 and 300 Part 2 and Passion of the Christ, etc. Uh, this is room 105, I think, right? Or it's 104. It's all the way down the end of the hallway. Um, and uh, no, I didn't, I didn't break into college here. I didn't, I didn't burglarize the place or anything or, or do anything illegal to get here. And uh, I don't know whether or not I'm supposed to actually be wearing a mask in here. So I'm going to assume that I should be until I'm told that I don't actually have to. Because uh, I, I would hate to assume the other assume that I don't have to and then be told that, well, actually, in actuality, I should be wearing a mask. But this may get real old real fast, and um, I'm probably going to stop wearing this pretty soon. Uh, so a couple of just, I think, preemptive, sort of preemptory things that I need to cover. Um, first of all, there is there's the issue of whether or not this is even a viable means of conveying the lecture materials. I don't know how well this is going to work, right? I, I, I assume that it's worth my while to actually come here to campus and do this. I'm, the, I'm not the only one here. There's actually a, uh, a nursing class going on just down the hall and around the corner, and hopefully I'm not so loud as to be obtrusive into their, their domain over there, but I don't know. Uh, I also saw that Matt Gage and Emily Geiger, uh, I think he's supposed to be in this class in like an hour and a half from now, and then she's going to be in the class next door, ostensibly, allegedly, in like an hour from now. So I don't know whether that's, that's going to actually happen. I went around and I knocked on their doors, and they're not answering. So. Um, I just have to assume that they're not going to be here, and that just gives me free reign to do whatever I want in here. Um, but that may that may not be the case. And uh, the other thing is, is, it's very unusual for me to be in here, just standing here talking to myself, because most instructors, most your instructors, are able to teach from home using whatever means they have available to them. Now, uh, as I think I may have explained this, I may not have explained this for our class, but I certainly know I, I told I told this to other students, not that they really matter for you guys. But uh, the reason I came all the way here. It's not because I just happen to be over here shopping at Walmart or something, right? Um, and I can always make an excuse to go to Houghton, but I actually came here today for this express purpose. Even though it's a beautiful day out, even though I would otherwise be walking around the woods with my AK-47 in camouflage, probably getting shot by hunters while doing so. Um, you can tell I'm, I'm pretty reckless when it comes to those things. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm abstaining from these misadventures, these opportunities to be engaged in misadventures, because, because I came here today uh, and, and I decided to do this, right? I mean, I, I did this in my own volition, and I did so because I thought that this would be, this experience, the totality of it, would be optimized for purposes of your pedagogical interests. So as to advance the collective interest, the collective learning interest, if you will, of the class. And I think that I can do more here than I can do at home. Now, the reason, if, if, the, reason, if the reasons aren't self-evident, which I think for most of you they probably will be, uh, most conspicuous, I think the difference is that I have the availability of demonstrating the, the visual aspects of the PowerPoint slides simultaneous with my actual discussion of the various topics. Now, that is advantageous, okay? Um, and that is a, a benefit which I do not, I would not otherwise have but for the fact that I'm actually here. So I say that that in and of itself confers a significant strategic advantage for purposes of our, our instruction. Now, it, it should be said that we don't really have much left for this class, right? When we, I got a lot of material that I should cover, ostensibly, but I, we just don't have a lot of time left to talk about, right? Um, so, what I what I'm also planning on doing, all right, and I really want to solicit feedback from you guys. So I hope that you're not your usual reticent selves and, and don't want to say anything, notwithstanding uh, a couple of you who are very participatory in your engagement. But uh, I, I want I want there to be some some concrete feedback with respect to whether or not you think this particular modality, if you will, this particular formatting of instruction, if this works uh, and if, or if it doesn't, and the reasons as to why you don't think it does work, right? Because I think so far this works. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna wander off camera every now and again because I've got stuff over here. You guys can't see, I've got, I got my bottle of booze over here, right? Uh, and uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be taking swigs from my my Kamchatka bottle uh, my my one liter uh, bottle of Kamchatka plastic bottle over here. Uh, no, actually I got my bottle of water over there and I got some other things. Um, the the markers that I'm gonna use to keep drawing on the board is in fact that requires it. But um, just so you know, and, and again this goes to the incongruousness of the presentation. But hopefully it's not too distracting for me walking all around here. 
Uh, but, but as long as I can do this, I'm going to continue to do this, right? Because I think that, as I said before, the benefit is that I get to utilize and avail myself, and indeed we all get to avail ourselves all collectively, the, 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 the value which is conferred by having the PowerPoint slides in the background, whereas otherwise, conversely, it would be me just holding up a sheet of paper with the stuff printed off on it in black and white. Wouldn't be very dramatic, wouldn't be very effective, and I think, therefore, this is uh, beneficial. Superior to the other alternatives. Okay, the, the problem that I foresee with this, right, and, and, I, and I will move past these, these preliminaries very, very quickly because I know you didn't come here to listen to me talk about this stuff, but uh, I think in some ways this, this needs to be talked about because if, we, if I don't address these things, then contingencies will arise that I hadn't actually planned for, right? So it's good to anticipate these things proactively and preemptively and therefore be ready for them when they in fact do eventuate. So um, the other concern that I have is uh, I'm in, as I said, room 105 or 104, whatever this happens to be. Uh, people may be walking around out here, all right? I, I, the, I think the cleaning staff is here today, right? And I don't know if the guy's going to come in here and try to clean the room when I'm in here. Uh, it'll be interesting. They, and that, that way I'll at least have an audience, right? I can at least talk to somebody as opposed to me looking like a total douche in this room talking. So, um, so that's, that's something that may actually confer some more tangible benefits to the experience by having random people walk in here and say, Jeff, WTF are you doing up in here? Get out of here, right? Uh, and maybe they'll chase me out of here and maybe I'll record that too and we'll put this up on YouTube anyway. So um, I'm just saying I don't have complete control of the environment, right? Because this is, after all, a quasi-public venue and there are other, I know there's another instructor here and I don't know if she's going to be walking around the hallway and I don't know if somebody's going to try to walk in here and take this classroom over and hopefully they don't because I'm going to be ready to brawl with them if they do. Um, but right now this is mine and I, as far as I can tell because we're just relegated to exclusively off-campus uh, off teaching right now, it seems to me that the rule should be first come, first serve, first in time, first in right. I'm the first one here, uh, as far as I can tell, all right, unless somebody snuck in here and is hiding on one of the pet tables that I can't see, right? Uh, so therefore, I'm the first in right. Okay, so that's that. Um, the, and again, give me feedback, right? I want feedback, because if this doesn't work, the, uh, the other option, the other, the, the other what I think is going to be the second most viable alternative mm -hmm. Uh, is me just opening up what my Moodle page for you guys, right? Because I, I, I've done this course, I've taught this course via Moodle, I've taught this course online, I've taught this course physically, obviously. Uh, but I have the online Moodle version, right? And what that would enable you to therefore do, I would add you guys onto my Moodle website, right? You just log into Moodle, and it's a very straightforward, intuitive process. And then you go and you listen to the slides, and the slides, or like, they look like this, right? You can see them better than this. And the, and the problem I'm having right now, I'm realizing this just now, I should have realized this eight, seven and a half minutes ago, uh, is that there's a lot of reflectivity with the surface and it doesn't resolve very well in the laptop video, okay? So there, this may or may not actually work very well. But I, I'm trying my best, right? I'm trying my best under the circumstances and hopefully you guys remember that when it comes time to do the student evaluation post, right? Remember, Jeff drove all the way from Calumet, all the way to Houghton, okay, the CCC Cotton Printer Center, just to teach this, this gosh darn class, right? Because I thought that it would be advantageous for you guys to be able to see the slides more effectively than would otherwise be the case, right? Remember that, okay? Now, the alternative, as I said, if this doesn't work out and you want to throw this out the window and say this is, this is a bunch of rubbish, this is just not feasible, it's not, well, it's feasible, it's not viable, um, is, to, is to go with the Moodle option. Of course, I could do these recordings in my home recording studio, which is not very illustrious. It's the one in Calumet, so it's not the really ostentatious, opulent environment that I have in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, and not that you guys really care about how luxurious the background environments are, but it matters to me because I'm a guy who's really concerned with aesthetics. Um, I won't have that, all right? I'll just be me talking behind that desk with the big flag draped behind me, looking very official, look like I'm ready to go fight the Crusades or declare jihad, depending on which of those slides you subscribe to. Uh, I don't particularly look forward to that, right? I don't like doing that. So what I, what I think the alternative option is, if, if, you, if you don't want this, okay, just understand what the implication is. If you say, man, this, this whole, you go into class, Jeff, this, this thing sucks, right? It reminds me of class. I don't like the background. I can't even see what's on the board anyways, um, et cetera. If you have some good concrete reasons, I'd like to know the reason as to why, or I'd like to know what they are. Um, and if, if not this, right, then it's going to be Moodle from here on out, okay? It's going to be website, it, and what, what it's going to be is you're going to log in, right? You're going to see the slides there. You're going to click on the slides, and on, in the slide will be embedded in a, an embedded audio file. You click on that, there will be a little button to press on it, right? And then it's going to be me yelling at you, okay? Well, me talking, which is yelling anyways, uh, about whatever it is, right? Ancient Rome, because that's coming up after these slides, right? 
That's how it's going to be, all right? So maybe that'll work. You won't have any video feed, all right? So you won't get to see my antics up here. Not that that really matters, me standing here like an idiot holding my mask on my face. Um, but you will have the sound effects, which certainly matter. And I think that these slides will be more conspicuous to you as opposed to this, because it seems to me that this is fairly inconspicuous uh, in the sense that it's obscured or obfuscated by the, the light that's emanating off the board. It's reflecting and refracting, and it's just, it's just a very obfuscatory process here. So this is problematic. OK, um, final point before we delve into the, this guy here on the slide. Uh, is I'm holding what you what I what you know I regard as being a essentially a sacred text, right? This is this is like the the Mahabharata or the the teachings of the Buddha, the life of the Buddha, or the the Old Testament to the, the Bible or something. This is actually the Blu-ray version of Gladiator. Now I don't know whether or not this will run on a DVD player. I know it runs on my computer, which I was actually surprised that it did that because this computer actually was manufactured about 15 years before they even came up with Blueberry, but it worked for some mysterious reason. Um, now, the reason I'm holding this up, two reasons. It's to remind me to talk about the X credit, and second of all, it's to also remind me that I am offering this to, to loan to anyone who's so interested in still watching Gladiator, right? And then pres presumably also watching Gladiator and then also doing the X credit uh, with the, the focus of the X credit being actually about Gladiator. Uh, which is now an option, right? It's not, it's not mandatory. Extra obviously is not mandatory at all. Um, but you don't necessarily have to watch Gladiator per se, okay? And I'm going to get into that here in a minute. But for those of you who really do want to watch this movie because I built it up and up and up and it's something so magnificent and marvelous that you just can't help but watch it, right? Okay, fine. You can borrow it from me, all right? You can borrow it. I'm not going to charge you any money. There's no rental fee, no, none of that, right? Or you can go to the, the, the Red Box at uh, the IGA there in uh, Calumet off of whatever that is, I don't even know what street that is, right? Uh, and they may, I, I can't actually say that they have it. I, I shouldn't advertise these having because I don't know where they have it. I'll go there and I'll look next time I'm there, which would probably be uh, uh, this Friday, right? And if they got it, well, then hopefully they, they won't be out of stock, right? But I think the easiest thing to do is to just go online, onto Google, right? And avail yourself of those slightly sketchy websites that are out there. And again, it's not illegal to use streaming websites the only thing that, the, 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 the point at which you transgress upon the laws as they pertain to proprietary rights, intellectual property rights, and uh, just theft in general, uh, intellectual property theft, is when you download something, right? Because otherwise there's no physical taking, okay? So to be able to prove theft, whether it's virtual theft or whether it's physical theft, you have to prove the element of taking, all right? And this is just a little bit of legal advice that none of you are really going to use because I know you don't go out there and take people. So, um, but for purposes of watching videos through streaming websites that are based in Ecuador or Nicaragua or Belarus or Russia or wherever else, uh, you're not actually taking anything, you're not violating the law, right? You're, you're not doing anything illegal. But I feel a little bit sketchy by getting up here and making a record of this as, as in my official capacity as an instructor for Bodovic Community College advising you to go out to Putt Locker or Bidville or Bot Locker or, again, the hilariously named Mega Load. Um, and these are all just streaming movie websites. There's, there's nothing pornographic about any of them. There's nothing you know, scandalous about any of them. Well, there's nothing, nothing illegal about them. Um, I would recommend doing that, right? That way you don't have to bother trying to meet up with me and get this for me. And who knows, I might not even have it anymore because somebody else might have borrowed it. But um, that's, that's, that's what I would recommend, you, okay? Now, but I'm just saying, he, I'm putting this out there, right? So, so there is. Uh, the other point I wanted to make is the, the extra credit itself needs to be I think at least touched on. Now I'm very, I was very explicit with respect to the directions that I that I sent out to you guys. So I I, I disseminated a document uh, by email. I sent it out by email attachment last night. Today is Wednesday, by the way, in case any of you really know or or care, I should say. It doesn't really matter. Um, but today is Wednesday. I'm, I'm a little bit behind the ball on this. I, I do apologize to the one person who emailed me at like 8:30 this morning asking me whether or not we're going to be in class, but. With all due respect, comrade, I think I made that pretty explicitly clear two days ago. I think I think, and, and I and I put my trust, I I, I, I put myself into the, the the safekeeping of the the fellow comrades in the audience that day as to whether or not I actually said that pursuant to the mandate that was promulgated by the state of Michigan through the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and pursuant to the administrative decision that was then necessitated by that decision, pursuant uh, by rather by the college that we were going to revert to exclusively online modality uh, as of Tuesday night, which would have been last night. So therefore, that would have precluded the physical convening of class on Wednesday or the time thereafter. I think I said something to that effect on Monday. And if I didn't, I apologize, and I'm pretty sure that I did, so I think I'm clear. 
Um, so, anyways, uh, that's that's a neither here nor there. But the, the the point about the extra credit is, first of all, there is an email that, that addresses itself to the extra credit. I think I set it up pretty generally. But then, if you don't, if you still are ambiguous as to what the extra credit actually entails and what it requires you to do, right? Then go go look at the document, right? Because it stipulates it's got to be a minimum of three to four pages, right? I think it's what it says, right? Three pa three pages minimum. It's got to be eleven point font. Uh, it's got to be Calibri or Cambrini, whatever is some Italian name, font type. Um, and it's got to be submitted to me by a, a Microsoft Word document, right? Now, some of you are, most of you are pretty good at following directions. I've noticed that, right? Because I've emphasized the importance, the critical importance of being able to follow directions. Listen to directions, assimilate yourself to what it is they're asking you to do, right? And then go out there and do that, all right? Some of you, a couple of you don't like following directions for some reason, okay? And I, and I, and I don't understand why that is the case. Right? Maybe you don't read the directions, maybe you don't think that they're important, maybe you don't care whether I'm asking you to do these things, but I'm telling you, you should care, because if you don't care, that's going to be reflected in the points that you lose when you actually get the assignment back, right? And that's always the case. That's why there's 25 or 26 or 20 points up for grabs whenever you guys take the test, right? There's just 23 points out there just for following directions. It's as easy as that, okay? Um, and so I'm trying to reinforce this. I'm trying to inculcate in your minds the imperative for adhering to directions and this is really about reading comprehension, but it's also about respecting what it is I'm reasonably asking, expecting you to do. So make sure you follow the directions with respect to the extra credit, because if you don't, you're not going to get all the points. And those are the free points. Those are the easy points. Those are the cheap points, right? So don't miss out on those. The extra credit, essentially, the way that I modified it, and the reason I feel as though I have to talk about this to some extent is because I have modified it slightly. Originally, it was come in here, right? Let's come into class, right? Not this classroom, but let's go back into our, our beloved chemistry lab. Uh, in a week from today, it was going to be next Wednesday. It was going to be the day before Thanksgiving, and let's just let's just sit back and watch Gladiator up there on the on the stupid uh, whiteboard, dry erase, crappy, untheatrical surround, uh, non-cinematic effect that we have, right? Uh, which I was trying to remedy by finding those old janky speakers from the 1980s that I actually found. I showed you guys, but I was so excited about that. But now, unfortunately, it's a moot point because now we don't get to use those after all. But um, we're not going to physically, obviously, all right, obviously, okay. And, and again, if you don't know anything about that, read the other email I sent out because I said I fought the I fought the good fight, right? I fought, I petitioned, I solicited the administration to the best of my abilities, and I and I made the arguments that I proposed I was going to make to you guys on uh, to them on Monday, right? Uh, I said that there should be certain exemptions, there should be a certain caveat, there should be a certain accommodation uh, for the same reasons that you make accommodations for nursing and criminal justice of all things, which I found to be rather profound, but. Anyways, uh, they didn't make the accommodation, so they didn't think that watching a movie was really a, a justification that would override the otherwise categorical prohibition against physical classes. So, anyways, I, I, I argued as best as I could, but alas, we, we, we didn't win that case. So, um, the long and the short of it is, though, because we're not physically coming in here and watching a movie, that means you go out there and you watch whatever, well, not, not whatever movie, right? Don't go out there and watch Frozen, okay, or uh, uh, Fast and Furious, right? Uh, or if you do, don't tell me about it, because if I know about that, I'll think less about you. I know that you watched all the Fast and Furious movies, especially if you watched all of them. That's a very bad sign. Uh, no, it's got to be relevant. It's got to be germane. It's got to be pertinent in some way, shape, or form to what is, whatever we are discussing in this class, right? Now, it doesn't really have to relate to everything in this class. It has to relate to something that we talked about in this class, right? Because the whole point, for you anyway, is the function of the assignment is to go out there and analyze, critically evaluate a particular film or television show or series or whatever, right? by juxtaposing its content with what we know and understand about the actual history as it played out in accordance with the factual record that exists, right? That's, that's the, the, the form and the function and the ethos and the mandate of the assignment, and that's what it is being asked to do, right? Now understand, this is, a, this is an optional assignment. It's not obligatory, right? It's not mandatory. It's voluntary, hence extra credit, right? It's extra, it's, 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 it's gratuitous. Some of you, I really think, need to consider doing this, okay? Uh, you guys should know, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I, I'm always aware of everybody's grade in this class at any given time throughout the semester. I can tell you exactly what your grade is at any given time, right? And, and if, if, if an instructor can't do that, well, I, I think that they ought to be doing it, right? You really be, should be assiduous in maintaining grade. So if there's any confusion as to what your grade is, reach out to me and ask me, okay? I prefer you call me actually about this because it's easier for me to talk to, me, to you about your grade as it is for me to just email or text you, God forbid, text. Um, so I recommend you t you call me, okay? Especially if you're one of those people who's kind of on the precipice. You're on the, you're on the, you're on the verge of, of possibly getting a D in this class, or God forbid, possibly not. 
I don't think anybody who's still enrolled in this class is in that is in that realm, is that the DEF realm. But there are a couple of you guys who are in well, not a couple. I think there's at least one of you though. That's near D territory, right? You're on the you're on the boundary zone. You're on the border, right? There's the border wall here, right? Here's C. Here's the land of D over here, and you're like right here. You're skirting the edge. If you're somebody, if so, somebody like that, I would strongly recommend that you do the extra credit. You do it right. You follow the directions. You make sure you know what you're doing, right? Uh, for the rest of you, it's not as imperative if you're holding a B or an A or even a C. Uh, well, if you're holding a C, I would recommend doing it as insurance against failing the final. But um, it's it's up to you guys. It, it's up to you. So, anyways, I've I've now sufficiently squandered 20 minutes of the, the class. And by the way, I don't know if I'm going to last two hours in here, right? It's not because I got to go run to the bathroom or anything like that. Uh, it's because I just I, I think that some somebody's probably going to come in here and tell me to get out of here. Number one, right? And it's going to be interesting because I'm going to I'm going to keep recording. You guys, you see what happens, right? It's like the it's like the body cam that the police are going to wear, right? They're going to come and try to chase me out of here, and I'm going to be like, no. I'm, this is my classroom, and let's see what happens. Uh, or somebody's going to tell me that I'm obnoxious because I'm intruding upon the class that they're trying to conduct next door. But I, maybe, maybe not. I, I, well, anyways, I'm just saying, I, I, as I said before, I can't control this environment, so therefore I'm not going to say that I'm going to be here you know, indeterminately, right? Uh, or for the next hour and whatever, 15 minutes or whatever we got on the clock, right? Because uh, I, I, I don't know that, okay? So, anyways, that's, that's an important preface to what it is we're discussing. So, let's go back to Buddha, okay? Let's go back to, to, to Buddhism, right? And we were talking, I was talking about how Buddhism uh, extols certain virtues as being worthy of emulation. And if you look at the life of the Buddha himself, right, what, what kind of life did he live? Well, initially it was a very profligate life. It was a very wasteful life. It was a very luxuriant life. It was a very licentious life, right? Licentiousness and profligacy just means that you go out there and you engage in hedonic activities. You're, you're a hedonist, right? You like to get pleasure for the sake of its for, the, for its own sake, right? Pleasure for its own sake, right? Uh, instant gratification as opposed to delayed gratification. That's the problem we have right now in this country because people can't just say, let's stop doing everything. Let's shut everything down for about four weeks, right? If we can shut everything down for four weeks, businesses, schools, etc., right? And then just wait it out. Well, the virus will go away. Okay, that's not to say that it won't ever come back, but it'll go away for four weeks, okay? If everybody does that, right? You gotta be categorical. But the problem is people don't do, they, they can't do delayed gratification. But Buddhism is sort of the ultimate expression of delayed gratification. It says, don't, don't embrace all the pleasures of life, don't embrace them so fully that you become so enamored with them that therefore it creates some kind of conditioning whereby you become dependent upon them for satisfaction, right? And so again, I would say that the, the fundamental philosophy of Buddhism is the ultimate repudiation of the materialism and the commercialism and the consumerism and the capitalism that is that is, that is inextricably associated with our modern day society and the ethos of this country, the ethos of our culture, if you are a popular culture anyways, which doesn't apply to you guys up here because we're up here in, in Yupra land, we have our own culture. But I would say that Buddhism is in many ways the ultimate renunciation or repudiation and, and the antithesis of the popular culture which we all, I can't say know and love, but which we all know of, okay? We all know of what popular culture in this country can, can consist of. So Buddha, Here's Buddha. No, I'm just kidding. That's not Buddha, right? That's that's not Buddha because they didn't have you know pan panoramic. They didn't have uh, Panasonic cameras uh, 2,500 years ago to take pictures of Buddha, and he didn't look that, like that guy. Was. That's actually the Dalai Lama, okay? And the Dalai Lama is to Buddhism as as the Pope is to Catholicism, okay? Uh, the Dalai Lama is essentially the 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 head of the Buddhist Church. Now you can't really say it's it's not a complete analogy because the Buddhist the, the Buddhism is more of a philosophy. It's more of a life outlook. It's, it's more of a way of, of organizing your life in accordance with certain principles and precepts, which are conducive to making sure that you optimize your flourishing, your human flourishing. You completely self-actualize, right? Because it's all about self-realization. And Buddhism, they talk about a path, right? This, this is the path to, to, to self-actualization. This is the path to the inner Zen, okay? And to be able to consummate those things, those rather esoteric things, you have, to, you, have to, you have to really think inwardly. You have to think introspectively. You have to be very reflective. You have to be very pensive. And, and through your meditations, right, and through your reflections, you will achieve this, this zen-like state, right? And zen-like state is just a tranquility, a peace of mind, if you will, it's a metaphor. Um, but it means that you've transcended all the physical attributes of this life, right? The, the physicality, the, the, the physical trappings of this life. And again, going back to what I said, I think the, the, the quote that I used from Star Wars Episode Three, right, for those of you who actually care about these things, 
uh, was when Anakin comes into the Jedi Temple, he goes to the, 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 the chamber of the, the Jedi Council, sits down with Yoda, and he says, he says, oh, Master, I had these, had these terrible dreams, and my, my wife, uh, Padme, played by the, the very voluptuous uh, Natalie Portman, he says, I, I, I have these dreams of prophesizing her doom, her death, and, and he says, what must I do, Master? Yoda says, you must train yourself to let go of all that you fear to lose. That's what he says, and exactly that, that voice, too, right? I don't actually have a, a Yoda voice player over here. That was me. Um, so I can do the Yoda voice as long as there's actually nobody here to witness how bad the Yoda voice is. I thought that was pretty good. But, um, so, so, so Yoda says, in case for those of you who don't speak Yoda, uh, he says, train yourself to, to, to let go. Train, train yourself to, to let go of all that you fear to lose, okay? Meaning that train yourself, condition yourself to live without the sorts of things that you are attached to, not just material things, not just... Oh, well, I gotta train myself to live without a, toy, a 2006 Toyota Sequoia. Man, that's gonna be tough because I love that car, right? I love that car. You know, my hierarchy is like family, right? And then uh, computer, car, dog, girlfriend. Ah, uh -huh. all right. I, I see. I got this on record, so I gotta be careful. I hope she's not gonna check this out on YouTube. Um, but no, the, the reality of Buddhism is is don't just train yourself to dispossess, become dispossessed of. The sorts of physical trappings that you have acclimated yourself to, right? That you, that many people become very dependent upon, okay? Because they need their blank and they need their car and they need their money and they need their well, that's the same thing, right? They need all the material trappings that are inextricably associated with this very materialistic life. And the Buddhists are saying none of that matters, okay? Transcend those things, okay? Transcend those things. And remember what what, what Buddhism originally was all about, okay? The, the original philosophy of the Buddhist. Was, was similar to the original philosophy of the Hindus, in the sense that if you achieve this inner Zen, okay, you can escape the cycles of life, okay? Now, they're not talking about the cycle of reincarnation because the Buddhists don't believe in any of that, right? That was what the Hindus were talking about, right? You can, you, it, it, is a, it is a means by which you can achieve some escape from the kinds of things that bind and constrain and hold down other people. Because you, you think about people who are not the, the sort of the anti-Buddhists out there, right? How do they live their lives? Well, they live their lives according to a very acquisitive mindset, right? Go out there, acquire new things, right? I'm acquisitive, okay? I'm covetous of other my neighbor's goods, right? That's a, that's an admonition of the Bible, right? Don't be covetous of your neighbor's wife or, or his goods, his donkey cart or whatever they have back there in Bronze Age Palestine, right? Well, the, the, the Buddhists would say the same thing. Now, the other point here. Uh, the, 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 I think a slight irony, okay, a slight irony, perhaps even a paradox. I don't know if Verizon did it, was, was paradoxical, but I, I perceive it as ironic, okay, and, and I'll let you adjudicate whether or not that's a fair uh, precy or representation of what I what, what is actually happening. So back to Dalai Lama, okay, this, this old guy, this old bald dude, right? Uh, and there are various metaphysical propositions concerning what the Dalai Lama actually represents, but we're not going to get into that because it's not a philosophy class, it's not a history, religion class, that. Uh, now, the Dalai Lama lives in this, this place, okay, and I don't know how, how well this is actually showing up on, the, on the, the screen of the laptop. Okay, well, not very well. Um, but this is this, okay, so I, I, now, I'm, now I'm having regrets about actually coming into this class and driving all the way over here. Oh, today, but, uh, this, this, is, this, is a, this is called the Potitea Palace, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, so I don't mean any intentional offense to those Buddhists out there that are listening. I'm sure there's uh, zero of you, but uh, this is this is this is essentially the home, the official home of the the leader of the Dalai Lama, who is the head of Buddhism, the, the sort of the not I guess the the, the, the figurehead, I, I suppose you would say, right? Not the literal head, not in the sense that he's the one who's the the executive functionary, right? Not not in the same sense as as uh, as what's his name. Uh, uh, not Pope Pius, uh, Pope Paul Francis, right? He has more executive jurisdiction of the church, the Catholic Church, than the Buddha does in relation to Buddhism, or the Dalai Lama does in relation to Buddhism. Now, uh, this also, interestingly enough, looks ex very similar to the place where if you're an aspiring ninja and you've been, you've decided to go on a very long vacation from Gotham City, and you end up over in Bhutan, and you climb up this mountain, and then you present this rare blue flower that grows on the south slope to uh, Ra's al Ghul, or fake Ra's al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson, and then you get in there and you get your ass kicked, right? That's, that's what this looks like. This looks like Batman's training facility is what this looks like, okay? And for those of you who have seen Batman Begin, 2005, Christian Bale, Liam Neeson, um, I can't remember, um, Katie Holmes, uh, 
formerly engaged to Tom Cruise. Uh, that's what this looks like, okay? I, I, and, and this is actually, this is in Tibet, okay? This is in Tibet, which is uh, near Nepal, uh, which is on the border of China, and I should, I should check my notes to make sure I'm, I'm reporting this accurately. Uh, yes, it is in Tibet, okay? And it has, it has over a thousand rooms. Now the point about, hopefully you, you see the paradox for what it is, okay? When you try to reconcile the philosophical precepts of Buddhism with the fact that the, the ostensible, the, the, the highest ranking, the, the, the highest ranking member of the, the Buddhist philosophy, if you will, right? Or the, 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 the highest ranking individual who subscribes to and represents and sort of embodies or personifies the ethos of Buddhism, that guy, the Dalai Lama, is living in a 1,000 room palace up there in the mountains of Tibet, uh, where, where he trains Batman in, in, in secret, right? That's where Batman gets his training from. No, that, that's not real. Uh, but th it looks kind of like it. Now, now do, you see, do you see the paradox? Do you see the irony? Do you see how that doesn't actually, maintaining a thousand room palace doesn't really comport with, or is difficult to make sense of in the context of embracing a philosophy which rejects the trapping of materialism, right? If you, if you have a philosophy which extols inner virtue, okay, the sorts of things that you should go out there and be altruistic and caring and compassionate, and you should train yourself to divest yourself of all the physical trappings of this life, all the materialistic things that, that, that corrupt mankind in his soul, in his spirit, in his mind, in his body, right? If that's the teachings of Buddhism, and you've got this Dalai Lama living it up like he's the, like he's the Mac Daddy up there in Tibet, and he's got a thousand rooms. He's got he's got one room for every more than so for two years he could straight up sleep in a different room, right? Assuming they're all bedrooms, which they're probably not. But uh, I just find that to be somewhat inconsistent, okay? And I want you to examine that that inconsistency yourself. If in fact I was going to ask you a theoretical hypothetical question on the next test which itself is not hypothetical, because that test is coming down the pipes real soon, right? Something about the paradox or the irony that is implicit when you try to reconcile the beliefs of Buddhism, the philosophy, the underlying precepts and principles of Buddhism, with the way in which the Dalai Lama comports himself, right? Is there some kind of fundamental irreconcilability? Now, for those of you who are philosophers of religion, precisely, right, or students of religious theory and such, Maybe you can find a way, but I think it would be a bit of a contrivance to make the argument that actually this, this works out and resolves itself. Right? I don't see how it does. It's like before Pope Francis, there was this guy, Pope Benedict, okay? And Pope Benedict had hundreds of bodyguards, okay? Secret Service, of course, Pope Francis still has that, so that's actually a good point. But um, he, 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 he would, whenever he'd drive around, he'd drive around in the, 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 the G Wagon, right? The Mercedes Benz G Wagon with bulletproof windows. And, you know, the leather seats and the moon roof and all the, right, $180,000 automobile, right, or the, the, the 500 series, right, the Audi 5000, okay? And, and, that, and you could say, well, that guy's, you, he's got a, man, he's, I, I like his taste in cars, right? He's got the same taste in cars that Vin Diesel's got in the movies Fast and Furious, right, which I just stopped referencing right now. You guys are going to think that I secretly go out there and watch Fast and Furious, and then I come in here and just make it seem as though I hate the movies because they're really actually so stupid. But, yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a closet Fast and Furious fan. I'm actually, the, I, got, I got all of them on DVD. I got all 15 of the movies that they made, right? Um, no, you know what, that, that's, that, there's something, I don't want to say hypocritical. I don't want to indict the Pope for hypocritical behavior, but there's something unseemly about that, okay? And not Francis. I'm talking about the guy before him. I'm talking about Benedict. Uh, Herr Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger. His eminence, Cardinal Ratzinger, before he was the, the Pope. Um, so this just goes to some of the fundamental, I think, incompatibilities or, or the, 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 the incongruous quality of religion when you try to make it compatible or reconcile it with the actual teachings which it espouses. And how in, in reality, it doesn't necessarily reflect or embrace those teachings which it so vehemently espouses in its rhetoric to its people. So, so there is some inconsistency there. This is actually going back to we, we don't, we're not going to get to this, this is actually not even in the scope of the class, but for those of you who studied the Reformation, Martin Luther, uh, you'll know that Martin Luther's uh, 90, 98 thesis, theses that he nailed to the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral in 1570, whatever it was, right, uh, essentially was repudiating the Catholic faith for that very same reason, right? The same thing that I'm talking about here with respect to the Dalai Lama living up there in his palace. And he's saying, well, 
those who reject, ostensibly those who reject materialism, right, for the sake of the belief that it, the materialism, uh, devotion to materialism, corrupts the spirit or undermines the efficacy of your 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 capacity to actually reconcile yourself to to a good and, and honorable Christian life, right? Those who embrace materialism are 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 are, 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 are trying to have it both ways, okay? And that 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 is a that is a, that is an unprincipled way of living one's life. Right, that is completely unprincipled, and you sh you shan't be out there teaching one thing and then living a lifestyle that is completely incompatible with what it is you espouse or what it is you teach or what it is you propagate through your rhetoric. So walk, talk the talk, but also walk the walk. Right, that there endeth the lesson. Okay, if you will, there endeth the lesson on this particular slide. Now, as I said before, I'm going to be doing a lot of walking around because the hopefully the, the audio feed is is still picking me up when I walk 15 feet away from the computer over here, but. Uh, I guess what I could do is I could do the Steve, Steve Jobs thing. Uh, if you guys have ever seen the movie Steve Jobs and Mike Fosbender, by the way, any movie with Mike Fosbender is worth paying to watch, okay? Just, it really is, okay? Not just because I'm a huge fan for the guy, but uh, I, 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 I do have something of a man crush on, even though I'm completely solid and heterosexual male. Uh, he's, he's an amazing actor, phenomenal. But he has this movie called Steve Jobs, and, and in the movie, he plays Steve Jobs. He's the autonomous character. And there's, if, you, if you've ever seen Steve Jobs, right, what he does is he gets up on the stage, kind of like what I'm doing, right? And he's walking around with his keyboard, right? And he likes to walk around with the keyboard because he likes to press buttons on the keyboard. And then the buttons on the keyboard interact with something that's going on in the background, right? And then it plays this video or this music or whatever. So look, I got to be like Steve Jobs. Booyah! Okay, there, there that's my Steve Jobs moment. And um, I still don't know how well this is actually showing up on the recording here, which it looks as though it's not showing up very well at all. Uh, so guys, if, 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 again, going back to what I said about 20 minutes ago, if you have any genuine grievances concerning the, the efficacy of uh, this particular modality of instruction, please do let me know because I, I don't care. I can do it either way. In fact, do, do, relying on Moodle would be easier for me because I, I don't have, I mean, I, 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 my work is all behind me, okay? I've already done all that, all right? Whereas here, my work is all ahead of me, right? I've I got to come in here, I've got to come all the way to Hope, and I've got to record these lectures, I've got to do this thing, and this little song and dance up here, I've got to set the room up, et cetera. Um, whereas on Moodle, it's all up there. It's just, it's just out there, right? And, and I, 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 so it, it, but don't, don't contemplate, don't place too much weight uh, on that. That's not the probative, dispositive factor in the calculus, right? What's dispositive for you should be whether or not this works. If it does, okay, fine, we'll continue doing this. Right? If it doesn't, tell me the reasons why, and I'll contemplate reverting or transitioning to a different form of instruction. All right, let's talk about the, the, Mar the great Maran Empire. Uh, it, it, before it was the Maran Empire, it was something called the... the the, the, the Magda, I don't actually know how to pronounce this, but I think it's called the, the, the Magada, Magada Kingdom, and this is in Northeast, Northeast India. Uh, so the, the Maran Empire was, was established by this guy named Chandra Gupta Mara. Okay, Chandra Gupta Mara, his name is up here on the slide, and hopefully you guys are following me along on your laptops or whatever, your devices, uh, because otherwise you're not going to be able to see, because this stuff is just... It doesn't resolve very well, as I said before. But uh, what, what's up here on the slide it says this guy. So this guy's name is Chandra, Chandra Gupta Mara, and he was the one who established the, the Mara Empire. So the the, 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 the the empire is named after the guy who established it, the guy who founded it. All right. Uh, now it's said it's said by some of the sources, and some of these primary sources are a little bit sketchy. But it's said that this guy Chandra Gupta Mara was essentially inspired to go out there and engage in all manner of offensive military operations whereby he was going out there and conquering as many different peoples and as many different tribes as he possibly could so as to uh, aggregate, agglomerate as much, uh, much territory and as much power unto himself as he could. He said, it was said that he was inspired to do this by the illustrious example of Alexander the Great, or Megos Alexandros, as he's known in Greece. And still known in Greece. In fact, a lot of Greeks still name them their children, their male children, Al Alex or Alexander, in, in honor of Alexander the Great. Now, ordinarily, okay, well, not ordinarily, but if no, actually, what, I, what am I saying? If this was a if this was a not a world history course, this is a Western civilization course that dealt with the same period of time, right, prehistory up to 1500. I would have an entire series of slides, probably about 28 slides, that just talk about just the life and times of Alexander the Great, right, and his predecessor Philip of Macedon, his father. Uh, and his, you know, his various exploits and his various conquests militarily and, and as well as sexually because he was very prolific with that as well. Uh, Alexander the Great was probably, probably the, I would say he ranks right up there with Jesus Christ in terms of his 
the lasting significance of his legacy and how impactful that legacy was on influencing the trajectory of the subsequent history of the world. Okay, And it's very, very few instances that anybody can actually say that about any particular person in history, where you can say, okay, well, this, this, the, the ramifications of this guy's life were so profound, right, were so um, transcendent, and were so long lived that they, that they really did impact, and, and, and constructively impact, and constructively influence the developmental uh, trajectory of civilization subsequent to this person's existence. You can say that about Jesus Christ, right? You can say that about, I don't know, you can say that about very few people. You can say that about Octavian Augustus Caesar, the first, uh, the first Roman emperor. You can say that about Julius Caesar, uh, his great uncle, the guy who just essentially was the death of the Republic of Rome. Um, you could say that about Alexander the Great, but those are very few people you could say that about. Now, 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 the relation between Alexander the Great and this guy, Chandragupta Mara, the, the, the eponymous founder of the Maran dynasty, the Maran, what later became the Maran Empire, is that Chandragupta Mara looked up to Alexander, looked up to him, not merely in, in, in the sense that he tried to, he wanted to emulate his great military exploits. He looked up to him as an exemplar of a man who goes out and asserts his dominance by conquering and subjugating all the various people who may conceivably challenge him. He looked up to him in that respect, but he also looked up to him in the sense that Chandragupta Mara was, was inspired by the, the, the very multicultural uh, example that, that, that Alexander had set. Now, I don't, we don't really have time to go into the, the life and times and the effects of Alexander's uh, existence, but uh, suffice it to say, Alexander was a man who was ahead of his time. Okay? And he was a very, very multicultural sort of guy, very progressive minded. Okay? And Chandragupta Mara looked at that and he said, I, I want to embrace that ethos. I want to embrace that mindset. And therefore, I'm going to rule my kingdom that I've named after myself because I'm such a, uh, a self conceited narcissistic D bag. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to embrace that ethos and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to use that to sort of modulate the way in which I treat my subjects. And it's going to also influence my foreign policy. And so what you see in the context of the Maran Empire is you see this infusion of different cultures, different languages, different traditions, different religions, different peoples from all around, not just India, but also from modern-day Pakistan, um, what was then Bactria, which is modern-day Afghanistan, uh, what, is, what was then, um, oh, I should know this, but uh, what is modern-day Osaira, uh, which is, well, not modern day, but, but uh, traditional, which is actually modern day uh, Myanmar, Burma. Uh, Sylvester Stallone was uh, over there, chopped people's heads off back in 2008, for those of you who've seen the, the Rambo movie. Um, and Shandra Kutamara decided, well, you know what, I, I want to try to incorporate all these different people onto the auspices of one great empire. So it's not just an empire in the sense that it's majestic and it's powerful and it can go out there and conquer and subjugate all these people. Yes, it's, it's a great empire in that sense, right, in terms of the territorial aspirations and the fact that it conquered so many people. But it's also, his empire was also a great empire in the sense that it was, it was an empire that was different than those which, which preceded it, except, excepting, of course, the empire of Alexander, but Alexander was unique, right? Uh, most empires said, we, we have this majority, right? We're the Romans or we're the Greeks or we're the... Egyptians, or the Babylonians, or whoever, right? And we're going to subjugate anybody who's not, who doesn't walk like us, and talk like us, and look like us, and preach like us, and believe like we believe in, and to speak our language, etc. Right? But well, Alexander and Shadrach and Tamar had this in common, right? They said, all right, we are going to tolerate and embrace and assimilate all these different peoples, okay? And we're not going to make it conditional. We're not going to say, well, you've got to learn the Indian language, you've got to. Uh, embrace the, the, the philosophical precepts of Hinduism or something, right? They're, they're without condition, right? Unconditional acceptance of these people, obviously, so long as they're law-abiding citizens and they pay the taxes, and that may be the real reason why, right? And maybe the real reason why, um, and if you think about it, this goes back to a question that I always ask in the context of teaching the history of Alexander the Great. It's a question that has, that resonates in, in a transcendent way because it doesn't just apply in the narrow context of Alexander, but it applies in this context as well. Uh, is, it, is it better, in the words of Robert Downey Jr. from the first Iron Man movie, is it better, as he's standing there in Afghanistan and he's ready to test his new missile launching system against the Taliban out there in those mountains 20 miles away and those four-star generals are standing around watching him and they're all drinking booze. He says, is, is, it, is it better, gentlemen, gentlemen, I can't do Robert Downey Jr. as well as I can do that. Uh, gentlemen, is it, is, it, is it better to be loved or feared? Right, or feared or respected, I can't remember. Is it better to be loved or feared? 
I say, is it too much to ask for both? That, that's, that's my very weak rendition of Robert Downey Jr. in the Iron Man. Well, I think Chandra Gupta would say, no, it's not too much to ask for both, okay? Or, 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 or maybe, he would, maybe he wouldn't say that. He would say, I think he would say what Alexander would say, right? Is that when you really think about it from, from a macro standpoint, Okay, on a large scale level, such as a state, a, a state or a nation state, uh, it is much better to be loved as opposed to be feared. Now, there's a lot of disagreement about this. Um, we don't have time for it, and it really doesn't fall within the scope of this class, so I can't really talk about it very much. But for those of you who are well versed in international relations uh, and, and international politics, uh, you will probably have heard of Niccolo Machiavelli. Okay? He was a uh, 15th, 16th century Florentine bureaucrat and diplomat and politician and thinker, philosopher. Uh, just a philosopher, just an overall intellectual of, of, of many great qualities. And he wrote something called The Prince. It was his magnus opus, his great work. And in The Prince, he, Machiavelli, advocates for, he espouses for the position that it's actually better to be feared rather than loved. Okay? He says that fear will motivate people to do things that love won't necessarily motive, be sufficient to motivate them to do. Okay, fair. That's all well, well and good and true, right? But I think that in in, in the empire, in the in the context of a very multicultural empire, a very multicultural empire, if you are trying to synthesize or assimilate or at least tolerate, accommodate all these different people with all these different religions, all these different philosophies, all these different cultures, all these different languages, all these different beliefs, you're trying to make that harmonious. You're trying to harmonize that. Then the question I pose is, is it better to be feared? Is it, is it better to put the, 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 the fear of the living gods of Hinduism in the, in the hearts and minds and the bowels of your subjects, right? Or is it better to espouse a doctrine of compassion and courtesy and consideration and accommodation and therefore cultivate the love and the respect and the reverence and the adulation of your subjects? I humbly submit that the latter is infinitely preferable to the former, and it, it, it hinges upon this fundamental determination. The threshold determination is how demographically diverse is your particular constituency, okay? This is sort of a uh, thing that we could talk about in, in the context of the philosophy of geopolitical relations, but it also relates materially to our conversation as it pertains to ancient India and the, the empire of the Mars. And I would submit to you that it is, it is better to be loved when you have so many different people. Because what, 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 does, what does that love and that respect that is, I think, is synonymous with it, what does that mean? What does that imply? What is it, it implicate with it? Well, it provides people with a unifying force. It provides them with something they can, always, they can all relate to regardless of their differences. And they can say, even though you're a Hindu and I'm a Buddhist, or you're an ethnic Pakistani and I'm an ethnic Greek, or you speak Greek and I speak Hindi, or whatever, right? Whatever our differences is, no matter how that line is, is demarcated and differentiated, right? The one thing we can all agree upon is we respect and universally revere our ruler. And I think Chandra Gupta Maro was sensible enough to appreciate that fact, and so too was Alexander. So part of the, the, the structure, the superstructure of not just the empire itself in terms of its physicality, but also in terms of its underlying ethos, the, the, the spirit, right? The, the spirit of the times, the zeitgeist of the Maro Empire, is, is essentially a continuation of, a perpetuation, a borrowing from, of the Empire of Alexander the Great, or the Macedonian Empire. Okay? So I, I want you to be able to make that connection, right? because it, it, it is an indissoluble one, and it is one that is very important to being able to understand what the, what the foundations of, really, modern India are. Because this, this principle, this, this notion of tolerance, this notion of accommodation, this notion of appeasement to people who are minorities, this is a notion that was, that was assimilated into the, the cultural fabric and the cultural mindset, the collective mindset, of the Indian people in the subcontinent, and it continues to be perpetuated yet to this day. Now, there is an argument against this, okay? Or rather, there's, there's an inconvenient historical fact that I, I cannot ignore, because if I did so, I'd be disingenuous to the historical facts as they, as they actually happen. And the inconvenient thing that I'd rather ignore, because I'd rather it not exist, but unfortunately it does exist, is that what you have to do is you have to juxtapose this kind of mentality, this kind of mindset, this kind of outlook with the caste system. Because just as this, 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 this philosophy 
of assimilation and accommodation and appeasement and, 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 and toleration is inextricably entwined into the fabric of the culture and the history and the people of India. Well, so too it must be said is the caste system is indissolubly connected to the fabric of the culture and the people and the history of the place itself. I'm going to take a drink of water. And I guess I don't need to announce that, but I figured for those of you wondering why I'm walking over there, and this is not this is not actually five o'clock vodka that I got in here to come shock over. Uh, pop off because those are all my favorite brands because they're the cheapest. Um, this is actually this is this is genuine water. Although you wouldn't know. Oh shit, you wouldn't know. I thought that was uh, I didn't know what that, what that was, but uh, there was some d disconcerting, alarming sound that just came out of this thing. It just scared the hell out of me. Um, okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna take a swig here. Now, so there's this idea that there's a fundamental incompatibility with the notion of the caste system, how it operates, the ethos, its principles, its mandate, uh, what what it, what it what it does, or how, how what is it what is it what does it do? What are its, its, its effects? What are its ramifications for for society, for people, for personal life? And then trying to make sense of that in the context of the Mauryan Empire and everything they represented and everything that they extolled as virtues. Okay. Uh, some other interesting facts about the Mauryan Empire, and a lot of this stuff, you know, the more I teach this class, the more I realize that the miscellaneous factoids are absolutely insignificant and completely devoid of any pedagogical utility whatsoever, right? And I think I, I may have sort of made that point rather abstractly in the very beginning of this course, but it's something that now that I'm standing here thinking about this, uh, focusing on the facts of these empires, these kingdoms, these men, or whoever, right? It's just, it doesn't really help you understand anything. And it doesn't answer the big questions, right? This, this is a big question class. I think all my classes are big question classes. And honestly, that, that's the way you should, that's the, well, that's the class that you should aspire to take, right? Or the kind of instructional methodology you should aspire to embrace is a big question one, not the small question. And who cares about, I don't care what, what the answer is so much as how you got to that answer. Now, it, it, it does bear mentioning unfortunately, okay, that we have to take into consideration some historical facts, because after all, this is history. One historical fact that is rather interesting is that Chandragupta Mara, the, the eponymous founder of this Maran dynasty, the Maran Empire, decided that he wasn't just going to talk the talk, but he was going to walk the walk in terms of multiculturalism. And he decided to marry the daughter of a guy by the name of Seleucus Nicator. Okay, interesting name. Seleucus Nicator. Seleucus Nicator was one of the Diodaci, and I'm speaking Greek here, so I, I know a few Greek words, I'm trying to phrase in Greek. The Diodaci in Greek meant the companions, and it referred to the companions of Alexander the Great, the Diodaci. And the reason they were called the companions was because they used to ride along with Alexander. They were his bodyguards, they were his generals, they were his closest advisors, and they were his personal friends. And Alexander the Great died very, very young. He died younger than well, younger than he should. He died, well, he honestly, actually has that in common with Jesus of Nazareth. They both died very young, relatively young. And, and when you get to be my age, you realize that 34, 33, or 35 is actually pretty young. Uh, they died around that age. Alexander died, I think he was 33 years old. And after the death of Alexander, his empire was divided amongst his diodaki, his companion guys. And the guy who staked out probably the biggest territorial claim, and, and it, was, it was one of those things where we, we are going to, we the Diodaki, we the successors of Alexander, we the inheritors of his legacy, are ostensibly going to divide up the world, okay? Because Alexander had literally conquered the known world. He had conquered, well, he conquered going from, from, uh, from Greece to Macedon to Thrace, across the Aegean, uh, into Asia Minor, into modern-day Turkey, uh, down into the Levant, modern-day Palestine, Israel, Lebanon, etc., uh, and then across the deserts, into what is modern day Iraq, uh, even as far as Iran, and then across even more, even across the mountains, across the Himalayas, into what is modern day Afghanistan, and Nepal and Tibet, and uh, Turkmenistan, and Azerbaijan, and eventually all the way into India. Okay, that, that was the scope, that was the swap and the expansiveness of his kingdom, including, by the way, Egypt. He had a little detour in Egypt and took over that as well. Now, the, the successors, the Diodaka, the companions of Alexander, decided to divide this area up, and this guy, Seleucus Decatur, was very wily and very, very persuasive and very charismatic and very effective at convincing the others to allow him to have control over one of the largest swaths of territory 
which later became known as the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucid Empire consisted of modern-day Iran, most of Iraq, uh, much of modern-day Turkey, and it, it, its eastern borders were so expansive, were so pervasive, that they actually abutted with, they, they were contiguous with, meaning they, they were, they had contact, physical contact with, the boundaries and the borders of the, the empire of Shandri and Mar, okay? And so you have, you have, you have the empire of the Marans, right, over here, because this would be east, because you're looking at this from right to left, it's left to right, so over here is east, right? And then you got the empire of Seleucid and Cater. It inherited the legacy of Alexander, died out that companion, etc. And because he was, because Chandragupta was a multiculturalist, not just in, in, the, in the sense of his rhetoric and his propaganda, but in also his personal beliefs and his, his own convictions, he decided what he was going to do. He, he, he was going to marry the daughter of Seleucus Nicator. And at this marriage ceremony, okay, the, the ancient historians talk a lot about this. They say it was, it was like the wedding of you know, Princess Diana to Char uh, Diana Spencer to Prince Charles, okay? It was a fairy tale wedding, okay? It was the it was the, 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 the wedding of, I don't know, Mark Anthony and Jennifer Lopez or something. Um, it, it, was, it was the wedding of the set, the, the wedding of the millennium, okay? The, the wedding of that millennium, right? That particular millennium. And in this, in this wedding, there was an exchange of gifts. The, the Marans received from the Greeks, right? Because Seleucus Nicator was a Greek and he embraced the Greek language, or got the Greek language, the Greek culture, Greek customs, Greek traditions, Greek gods, etc. cetera. The, the Marans received from the Greeks a, 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 a selection of some of their finest philosophers. So Seleucus Decatur said, you know, he went to the, 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 the school of philosophy there in, in Seleucia, and he said, let's get together our finest stoical philosophers, and we will, we will send them to the Mars as a, as, a, as a wedding present, if you will, right? Uh, as, as, a, as a dowry back in the day, right? They would have produced this as a wedding dowry. And the, so the Seleucid, the, 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 the Marans, the Chandra Gita Mara, got, got philosophers. Now, now that, that is significant because what, what those philosophers do is they set up shop, proverbially speaking, right, in India. And as a consequence of this, they begin to propagate and disseminate their thinking, their ideas, their philosophical intellectual notions, and those notions begin to take hold. And they begin to influence the trajectory, the developmental trajectory of philosophy in India itself. And so you have transplanted Greeks, right, who are really members of the Seleucid Empire, right, but in their philosophical beliefs and their precepts and their training and their intellectual pursuits, they embrace the teachings of Socrates and Euclid and Epicurus and Epictetus and Plato and all the other great Greek philosophers. And they import that. They, 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 they are transplanted physically, actually, right? And then they begin to import these ideas. And so there's an intellectual exchange that transpires incidental to this wedding. Now you ask yourself the question, well, the Marans, they, 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 they came off pretty good at the end of this, right? They got a whole, they got 20 or 30 philosophers. These guys are uh, PhD level philosopher, men of education and erudition and knowledge and skill and training. And you say, well, what's, what, what, what is the other side of the scale? Where is the reciprocity here, right? What's the quid pro quo, if you will? Well, I, 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 hate, to, I hate to have to say it, because it's, it's rather unmentionable, but the Seleucids, in return for giving the wisdom and the knowledge and the erudition, the philosophical insight that they imparted to the empire of Mars, they got in exchange for all that. They got some elephants, okay? And you would say to yourself, well, what, were they trying to set up a zoo or something? Were they, were they, was this, this like an exhibit that they're going to put these elements? No! And when I first heard about this, I thought that that was, I thought, well, the Greeks got, got deceived. They were bamboozled. That's not a very good deal, right? I'm going to give you all these wise men of erudition, these men of philosophical training, and all I get is some elephants? But you have to think about it strategically, okay? You have to think about it in terms of the, the pragmatic connotation that an elephant has, right? It doesn't just demonstrate that you are an empire that is very vast and very eclectic and very eccentric. And in and, and the sense that it is, it is a measure of your, your vastness because it conveys to people that, look, we have such exotic creatures that we have control and dominion over. Our empire is that much more pro profound and prolific and powerful by virtue of the fact that we have exotic creatures. That was what the reason why when we talk about Rome, we're going to talk about the Roman 
um, the big ceremonies that they have, the Roman triumphs in, in the city of Rome, or a conquering general who would come back after he defeated the Gauls, or uh, the Germans, or the Britons, or the Celts, or whoever it was, and he would come back to Rome, and they have this triumph, and he'd be, he'd have this train, this long train of slaves, and after the slaves, he'd have all these exotic creatures, right? He'd have grizzly bears, and cheetahs, and lions, and tigers, well, lions, and tigers, and bears, right? That's who he'd have, right? And this is meant to convey to the people the, the power and the majesty of Rome, right? And I think that that essentially was what the, the, the rationale was, if you will, if you want to try to rationalize this as best you can in a way that I mean, really the only way that makes any sense to me is to say that, well, this, this imparts some exotic quality or confers some exotic quality unto the dynasty of Seleucus Nicator, right? To say, well, look, look how majestic our empire is, right? We've got elephants up in this, right? Okay, that's like having a zoo, right? You could have a real crap zoo, which just has some squirrels and, you know, some birds in it or something, right? Or you can have a really, really eclectic zoo, and you can have hyenas and water buffalo and wildebeests and things of that nature. And I think that that, that draws people, and it impresses upon them uh, just how, well, maybe not how powerful you are, but how eccentric and eclectic and diverse your, your empire has to be. Now, the other, the other function of an elephant, of course, for those of you who are thinking tactically and militarily, is that you can train them to fight in battles. And for those who have not fought against elephants, that is like using a tactical nuclear weapon in an otherwise conventional battle. It confers upon you a very unique and very profound tactical advantage against your adversary who is sans elephant, right? Who doesn't have elephants, who doesn't know anything about elephants, and probably never seen elephants before. They're, they're, they're creatures which, which in, 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 inculcate in the hearts and the minds of the enemy. They, 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 they fill them with terror and, and fear and trepidation. So that's, that's what's happening in, uh, in India at this time. Now, the other thing that I think we should talk about is this, this, this sort of culture, this concept of cultural assimilation or, or cultural accretion. Uh, and I did talk about this before, a very long time ago in the context of ancient India, well, more, I guess even pre-ancient India, uh, this is about, I don't know, 10 weeks ago, so you guys probably don't remember this, but um, what, what I talked about was this, this notion that cultural accretion, okay, if you remember back to it, all the way back to test number one, is this idea where you have these two distinct cultures, okay, they have, they have different languages, they have different beliefs, they have different religious practices, different traditions, different histories, uh, different philosophical precepts, their outlooks are different in life, but yet they come together, and there's a blending of sorts, there's an amalgamation, and they impart different qualities unto each other. And so this is this is this notion of cultural accretion. I, I mean, I refer to it as cultural accretion. I think that's my own word, my own term. And the reason I call it that is because it's reminiscent of the, the accretion of matter in astrophysical concepts, right? In, in an astrophysical sense, right? When you're talking about astronomy and cosmology, there's this notion of, of the accretion of matter. When you have a very supermassive object in a binary star system, where you have two objects um, tidally locked together so that they don't fly off and go into the outer space, uh, and you have you have usually there are two stars, right? Uh, but it could be a it could be a light a, a, a big blue giant or a red giant gas giant right with very light elements helium uh, carbon things like that uh, and then you have this supermassive object that that is a binary companion and it's a neutron star so it's very very massive and it's accreting the matter it's stealing the matter from the other one, right well that's unilateral so I guess that that, that analogy breaks down after about thirty seconds but um, what I should say is that this is not unilateral right this exchange is going bilateral both ways. So the Indians living in the Mauryan Empire took elements of Greek culture and Greek tradition and Greek history and Greek philosophy and they infused that into their own culture. They embraced those things and they promulgated this new culture and so it's this synthesis. It's the creation of culture. Now if you want to understand this concept, if you want to really think about it in more contemporary and perhaps ways that are more intuitive to your, your sensibilities, think about, the, think about this great United States that we live in, right? Or maybe some would say not so great. But um, you know, I, I still think that it's, it's, a, it's a great enterprise, it's a great undertaking, because it represents something new that we've never really tried before. Give us your tired, your hungry, your sick, and your downtrodden. So saith the Statue of Liberty, right? That's inscribed on the pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. When you, when you, when you take the boat there across the, the Hudson River, across New York Harbor, and you go to the island there. Um, I think it's, I can't remember the island. I should know the name of the island. I've never been there, but Governor's Island. 
and, and you drive by and you see that you take the tour of the statue of liberty. Give us your tired, your hungry, your poor, your sick, and your downtrodden, or something to that effect, right? Now, it should say, if you, Trump had his way, he'd go there and he'd spray paint some graffiti on there, he'd cross out all that, and he'd say, uh, don't give us anybody unless they've got a lot of money and they can invest in the financial uh, and physical infrastructure of this country, right? And we're going to be more selective. Now, the point I'm making here, okay, in a very circuitous sort of way, of course, is that this country, the United States, for a very long time, and I think still to a greater or lesser extent to this day, is in many ways sort of a simulacrum, a modern-day modern day version of what the Marred Empire was 2,000, not quite 2,000, 1,500, 1,600, 1,700 years ago. It's, it, it's a modern-day version in the sense that you have all these different people from all these different countries with all these different beliefs and religions and languages and customs and heritage and history, and you have them coming to our shores and blending together and, and taking their talents and their resources and their skills, and their creativity, and their insights, and their work product, and their effort, and making something, something great, something great, contributing in a functional, constructive way to the betterment of all. I think that that, that is a worthy undertaking. I think there's something transcendently noble about that. And I don't want to spend too much time waxing about this, but I think that the, the, the reason it's important to understand this is because this, these concepts, Right, this this esprit de corps, if you will, or the, the zeitgeist of the, the, the Empire of Chandra Gita Mara is something that is recapitulated throughout the history of subsequent Indian dynasties. And it creates a template. Okay, what is a template? It's like that that, that exam that I give you guys, right? I send out a word document, I say don't modify this, right? Just, just type your response, right? Don't change the font, type of the font color or anything like that. I got a drink here. So just keep paying attention. A template in a cultural context, historical cultural context, is something that exists, right? It's pre-existing, and people revert back to that because it's the common common denominator, right? It's the thing that they all know, it's the thing that they all they don't they don't all like it, but it's the thing they all understand because it's existed before something new, okay? And if you say that the the empire of Chandra Gupta Mara was was one which was so emphatically concerned with uh, tolerating and accommodating and appeasing and assimilating all these different people, well then that tradition is going to be perpetuated throughout the historical record of India. And in point of fact, to a greater or lesser extent, it mostly is. Now again, the, 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 counter, the counter argument to all of this, which, which I, I can't necessarily say that it negates this philosophy that I'm talking about, this philosophy of inclusiveness, but it, it, it certainly, in, in, in its essence, does fundamentally repudiate or represent the antithesis of it, is the idea of this, this caste system, right? Because the caste system is, as I suggested in those questions that I asked you guys a few days ago, is inimical to libertarian values. So I don't want to really spend much more time on this, um, but it's important to understand that there was this, this infusion of these different, these different cultures. Now, I'm going to go to the next slide. And as far as you can probably tell, as far as you can probably see, because I'm looking at it right now as it's being projected back on the screen of the laptop here, this looks like nothing but a bunch of amorphous colors and blobs sort of congealing together to make an image that is completely unintelligible to your eyes. I, I think that's a fair representation of what this actually looks like. Uh, what, it, what this is meant to show is the expansion of the empire of Chandra Gupta Mara, the Mara Empire. And what it's meant to convey because right, it shows one thing, it conveys a point though, it shows, it shows an image but it conveys a point. The point that it conveys is that the empire was very large. So of course, that's an important point, right? Oh, look at, look at that, the empire is very large, that, that's certainly important. Uh, well, it's, it, it's important to understand that the empire was large in the sense that it incorporated many, many different constituent populations, which had many different beliefs, many different religions, many different languages, so on and so forth. All right. Let's see what else is up here. This is meant to show, again, this is, so this is, I don't know what slide number this is, guys, but this is a slide after the, the, the division, the tripartite division of, of India there. There's three pictures of India, and it shows the progress of the Mara Empire. This slide is meant to show the contact between the physical contiguous border, international border contact between the Empire of Chandra Gupta Mara and the Empire of Seleucid Nicator, the Seleucid dynasty, the Seleucid Empire. And what it's meant to illustrate also 
is that this particular area of the world at this particular time was a fairly multicultural place because there was a lot of trade going on, right? And one thing that we don't really talk about in this class, which I think you know, maybe we should, is that the, the incipient beginnings of the Silk Road, and we talk about the Silk Road much later in history. We talk about it in the, the Ottoman period, in the 17th and 16th centuries. But the, the beginnings, the primordial beginnings of the Silk Road originated at this time. And so what the Silk Road is, is essentially a giant ancient highway system, if you will, right? It's like a giant highway system. Imagine I-75, right? You can take I-75 from St. Ignis all the way down to Key West, Florida, right? And all, all the way to uh, Marathon, actually, which is out past Key West, right? If you watch the movie True Lies, you'll know all about that because there were some terrorists that tried to detonate a nuclear bomb in that movie with out past Marathon. Um, Anyways, you take 75 all the way from, from imagine that, from, from, from St. Ignis, right, all the way down continuously, if you're, if you're drinking a lot of Red Bull or, or you know, snorting a lot of cocaine, uh, like some of the over-the-road truckers do that I know, right? You, if you get your cocaine, you get enough lines of cocaine up there on your dish, right, and uh, you just snort your way all the way down to Florida, right? Uh, think about that. That's a long ways to go, right? That's a long ways to go. Well, that's, that, that's nothing compared to what the Silk Road was, right? The Silk Road went from the Far East. I'm talking about modern-day China. Okay. through northern India, through Pakistan, through Afghanistan, through Iran, through Iraq, all the way to the Mediterranean, okay, all the way to Egypt or Sidon or, uh, oh, I don't know, Lebanon, modern-day Israel, the port cities there in the southeastern, southeastern Mediterranean. And then they load things up on the ships, and they take those ships, and they bring them up to Italy. And that was the, the Silk Road. Okay, well, it, it began at this time. Now, why is that, why is that significant? Why is that important in, in the context of what it is we're, I'm talking about here by myself in this room? By the way, you guys don't realize this, but it's, it's hard to talk to yourself for an hour and 45 minutes. It's really hard, okay? Especially when you've got an empty classroom. And I remember one of my students told me uh, back in the day when I was telling him of this, this possibility of me having to record things like this for online classes, he said, he said, well, you know, Jeff, if you can talk to an empty room for an hour and 45 minutes, you can talk to any audience of any amount of people. And I thought to myself, you know what, you're absolutely right, okay? Because it's, it's actually a lot easier when you've got people to look at and engage with and interact with, as opposed to, I got myself, all right? I got to sit here and talk to myself, all right? Pretty lame, pretty lame, okay. Lame as it is, it's the only option we have. All right, let's talk about a show for the brain. I think he's coming up here. Show up to the grave. Okay. So the the problem with the legacy of the show of the grave. Let's start. Let's start off with the problem with, with the show of the grave. Now the problem is that his legacy, the authenticity and the integrity, and the legitimacy and the veracity of it, is is essentially undermined in the sense that the 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 sources that we have, the extant historical sources that we have, the primary sources that we have, not the secondary sources. The sources that were created at the time were one of two types. Either they were sources that Ashoka the Great, so called, created himself, right? So they're royal propaganda, right? This guy becomes the emperor, the, the emperor of the Maran Empire, right? They're, 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 they're thing, it, so it would be like if the history of Donald Trump was written by Donald, the, 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 the history of Donald Trump consisted of his Twitter feed, okay? And then the autobiography that he goes on writing. That wouldn't be a very comprehensive or fair or reasonable history, in the sense that it would be very unilateral. It would be very monolithic. It wouldn't account for any other viewpoints, those which may not necessarily align ideologically with his own conception of himself. That's the problem that we have with the, the much of the primary source material that comes from this particular period. Is it is it is literally state propaganda that was commanded by, or was designed by, or inscribed at the commands of, the behest of, Ashoka himself. So you must, therefore, be implicitly distrustful of that material when it comes from the person who is trying to represent, whose interest it is trying to represent in, in, into posterity, into perpetuity, into the future. So, so there's, there's, that's rationale number one. That's argument number one, exhibit A, if you will, against the authenticity 
of the claims that are made about the doings of Ashoka and, and whether or not they were actually great and whether or not they were actually real, if they even happened. We know he was we know he was a guy. We know he actually existed. What, 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 whether or not he did what he what, what is said about him, we well that's subject to disputation. The other problem is that all of these sources have sort of a religious Buddhist inflection to them, in the sense that everything that you hear about Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, right? When we talk about the Nazarene, we have two sources. We have what the Romans said about him through this guy Josephus, who was actually a Jewish historian who actually converted to Roman paganism, and then he became a Roman and he talked all about Jesus. Uh, and Josephus isn't very reliable because Josephus was essentially he was a wannabe Roman. He was a Jewish guy, but he, he admired and respected and was reverential towards the power of Rome and the glory of Rome. He just writes everything in a very propagandist manner, right? So you can't really you got to discount that. And then we've got the the New Testament, right? We've got the New Testament. The New Testament is written by the disciples of Christ. You can't trust them, right? This is this is kind of what what is known in 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 empiricism, right? A class which partakes of the empirical method, right? Which is to go out there and to use your senses to engage with the world to test whether or not things are actually happening in the way that you think they are. Uh, empiricism asserts that it is necessary. If you're a biologist, or a chemist, or a physicist, or an astronomer, it is necessary for you to test your assumptions by not allowing this notion of confirmation bias to come in and contaminate your, your conclusions. Right? So confirmation bias is saying, I, 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 I'm going to say I'm going to ascribe greater truth or credibility to this thing because it, 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 I want it to be true. Right? So what you have to do is say, well. What's the, what's the negative of that? What, 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 what is the contra of that? The contra is, I, I don't necessarily want this thing, I, I, I hope this thing isn't true, right? But yeah, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the evidence as it is, and I'm gonna, assi I'm gonna assign credibility to it, even though I don't necessarily like where that evidence leads, right? That's, that's what you do by, that's how you avoid confirmation bias, right? Confirmation bias, again, is just the subjective interest that we all have, which contaminates our capacity to otherwise objectively view whether it's empirical evidence in the sciences, the natural sciences, whether it's empirical evidence in the social sciences, like criminal justice and political science, or whether it's just physical facts, right? Hard, inexorable facts, like we engage with in the context of history. Okay, so confirmation bias. Be, be, be wary of that. Now, why am I talking about that? Well, because if you think about the, the plausibility of some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here, okay? Going back to this 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 item, this issue of this Buddhist inflection and everything else, right? If everything has a Christian inflection to it, can you trust what that source material says about Jesus Christ necessarily? The answer is no. And it's not blasphemous to say this, it's just an axiomatic fact of life, right? I mean, look, if I go out there and start my own religion, and the people who write about my religion subsequent to my demise are my 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 highest ranking associates, right? Are you gonna necessarily ascribe a great deal of credibility to what they're saying? Jeff was a god, right? Jeff had godlike charisma. He was the greatest professor of, you know, etc. Right? Well, no, don't believe that. What you'd have to do is you'd have to look at those people who say, well, you know, Jeff is a douchebag and he's just, you know, he played too much Skyrim and this that. He didn't like to get up early and blah blah blah. He was complaining all the time. And then you reconcile that with the good, right? Now we're not getting a lot of the bad, okay? Because the, the people who would have been denigrating the legacy of Ashoka or or, or espousing a particular rhetoric. That was was deleterious to the preservation of a, a, a more idealized version of him. Those people would have been expunged from the record, right? Either they themselves would have been literally expunged by having their heads cut off, right? Or that what their 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 writings and their work product would have been effaced, would have been nullified, okay, and would have been over superseded by the propaganda that Ashoka is trying to disseminate on his own behalf, at his own behalf. So the life, the life of Ashoka, let's talk about Ashoka and why he's such an interesting character. So he's one of these guys who I think the, the, the story arc, the narrative arc of his life is one that's, I don't know if there's any real similarities here, but I think in general, it's one that says, this is somebody who started off a very selfish, very nefarious, very diabolical individual, indeed, very sadistic individual, very perverse person. He started off like that, and then he transformed and experienced a catharsis. And a catharsis is essentially just a transformation of one's spirit, one's soul. And through that cathartic enterprise, through that cathartic undertaking, he became a noble man. He was ennobled. 
And through his ennobling, he became a greater and better and more honorable and decent and altruistic and caring and compassionate person, all the sorts of things that we want him to be. That's the story. Okay? And the details in this particular context, actually, I think they do matter. So Ashoka was born to his father, who was the emperor. And Ashoka was one of, allegedly, he had a hundred brothers. Okay? Ashoka has a hundred brothers. Now, when I say this guy, he has 101 brothers, right? It's just 101 Dalmatians, right? You say, well, that's very interesting. Now, why would you say that's very interesting? Why would you doubt the, the plausibility of this assertion? Well, because he has no sisters, all right? Now, I don't know enough about the heritability of certain genetic traits to be able to say, you know, what is the probability of a man and woman, okay? And by the way, it was, it was a man in multiple ways because he was the emperor, so he could do whatever he wanted, right? And so m most of these brothers were half brothers. They weren't like his fraternal, you know, biological twins or anything like that. They were half brothers uh, through different, you know, um, uh, matrimonial lines, different, different mothers. Now, why was why 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 is that? And well, the reason it's implausible to begin with. The first thing that I'm saying about the guy strikes you as just incongruous with everything we know about human biology and just genetics, the way in which genetics are propagated, and you know, the, the heritability of certain qualities is that it would be. I don't know what the odds are. I should actually figure this out because I would like to adduce some kind of evidence here, the, in, 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 in negative evidence to, to, to prove that this actually would be a near uncertainty or a near impossibility. I don't know what the odds are, right, of having 100 children and they're all men. But I, it strikes me as incredible, 101, actually, because that's, that's the choker was 101. It strikes me as profoundly unlikely. And so he's got these, these 100 brothers right around. And it was said that Ashoka was not very well liked by his brothers. He was sort of the runt of the litter. Uh, and he wasn't like he wasn't very well liked by his father either. His mother adored him. His mother loved him. She she was a very dotting mother. She dotted on him. Uh, and she didn't dot on a lot of the other brothers because they weren't her children, because again, they were half brothers. They were brothers that the, the father had uh, relations with other women. She produced those brothers. And so he's a bit of a mama's boy, all right? And, and we know a lot about what she should know about mama's boys, right? They're not very tough, they're not very resilient, they lack fortitude and tenacity. I can't say that about all mothers, mama's boys, but that's generally the, the, the concept that we have, right? The conception that we have when we say that. So, so Ashoka was a spoiled little brat, all right? Now, I want to say he was a little bitch, actually, and uh, you'll, you'll see the reason as to why I say that here in a minute. And he, he, it was said that he had very coarse, very rough skin, and that was considered to be a trait that was, in many ways, incongruous with his royal birth, with his royal noble lineage. You were supposed to have very fair skin. You were supposed to go and... You know, get get manicured and get, get Botox injections and have your skin look like I don't know Kim Kardashian skin or something, right? Uh, and by the way, her skin is actually pretty deplorable because she's had so many surgical operations. But uh, the notion here is that Ashoka had very he didn't look the part, okay? He didn't look he didn't look very princely, right? He wasn't very aesthetically pleasing, and apparently he had a very bad attitude too. He was he was a very mendacious young man, very deceptive, very devious. And, 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 and not somebody who you would be inclined to trust, not a very congenial individual. Now, it said that uh, after the, the demise of his father, the other brothers, right, because you'll see the point as to why there's 100 brothers and not, you know, 75 brothers and 25 sisters, or, you know, 75 sisters, 25 brothers. The point is that the, the way in which the, 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 the kingdom was passed down, was through the, the concept or according, in accordance with the precepts of the, uh, the principles of primogenitor. And primogenitor means that the eldest son inherits all the power from the father. Now, if you're a Shoka and you, you're, you got a hundred elder brothers and you, you, know, you're, you look like a mutant or something because your skin's very rough and coarse and you, know, you got horrible acne or whatever it is, right? You're just a kind of a disgusting degenerate. But you're, you're literally last in line, right? There's a hundred other guys standing in front of line, right? And, and you're number 101 for access to all the power, all the prestige, all the honors of the monarchy, becoming the next ruler of the modern empire. And if you're a Shoka, you're thinking to yourself, man, this sucks, okay? I, I, not only do I have horrible skin, and I can't do any you know, skin treatments because they don't have Botox back in the day, um, but everybody thinks I'm a bit of a douchebag because I, you know, I, I like to lie, I like to deceive people, and, uh, and I'm you know, this, this little bastard mama's boy. Um, and so what it said that, it said, that Ashoka goes out and murders each and every one of his brothers. He goes out there and he commits sort of a genocide on his a fratri multiple fratricides, right? So, so a, a, a fratricidal maniac, right, is, is, is the, the beginnings of Ashoka, right? This, this is his origins. 
the origin story, the Wolverine origin, the Ashok origin. Right? They could make a movie about this guy. They really could, actually. In fact, they have. Uh, there's a Bollywood movie, which is the, the Hollywood, the Indian version of Hollywood, uh, and it's a movie called The Show. It's just called The Show, right? And it's about you know this guy being a douchebag and he's a young man and he turns into somebody much different, uh, thankfully. So he, he starts off his life by murdering honor of his brothers, and then he becomes the king, okay? And it's also said about Ashoka by these, these sources which can easily be impinged, right? or you can impugn their veracity and credibility by virtue of the fact that they have a particular motivation to them. They, they, this is the Herodotus effect, if you will, right? Tell me about the Herodotus effect, right? Herodotus was a, a Greek, and he's writing about the Persians disparagingly. So they're, they're in, and he's Greece was at war with Persia at that time. And this, and this is a subjective contamination of history through the filter of particular historians, such as the case with the the, the analogs of, of Confucius, or the analogs of, of, of Ashoka and his partisans, and those who propagated his message. Now it's said that the because the Maran Empire was a very big place, it had a very large bureaucracy, and in this bureaucracy there were 500 ministers. 500 ministers of state, and they all held this high rank. And these ministers, apparently, Ashoka didn't feel as though they were sufficiently loyal to him. They, they lacked loyalty. They, they weren't willing to go out there and do whatever he commanded. And the test of loyalty that he gave to them, he said, he called all his ministers, ministers into this big throne room, which is his personal chamber. He said, ministers, I command unto thee, go out and procure for me all the wildflowers and all the 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 flora, the, all the various vegetables and vegetation that grows in this kingdom, and bring, pick, hand pick them and bring all of them back into this order. Now, of course, this is an impossible order, right? This is that's like go out and count, go out tonight and look up in the night sky and count all the stars that you see, right? And I want you to come back to me tomorrow morning with a catalog of all the stars. Now, tell me how many there are, right? Go, 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 start. You guys can do this because you live in a very rural area with not a lot of light pollution, right? Not a lot of contamination from, from artificial light, not a lot of ambient light in the atmosphere. And you go up there, and, and you know, from, a, from an astronomer's standpoint, you can actually appreciate the cosmos up here. Go up there and try to count those stars. You're going to get bored. You're gonna, that's going to get real, real fast. You're probably going to get tired after the first you know, 150, right? Well, that's kind of like the order that Ashoka gives to his ministers. Go out there and, and pick all the wildflowers. Go pick all the vegetation that grows in my kingdom. Well, you guys saw the Maran Empire was a pretty big kingdom. It was vast swaths of territory across the, entire, the entirety of the Indian subcontinent, including modern-day Burma, Myanmar, uh, places as far afield as Tibet and Nepal. That, that, that's a pretty tall order. Go out there and pick. Well, what, what is this nonsense, right? That's like count, count all the grains of sand on the beach in Kalyamat Harbor, right? C count each and every one of the individual microscopic, minuscule grain of sand and come back to me in a couple of weeks and tell me how many grains of sand there are. I don't know, 55 trillion, right? I, a lot, okay? And because the ministers, even though they went out there in good faith and they started picking the daisies and the dandelions and the magnolias and whatever else was growing out there, and, and they came back to the next day, they said, you know, here's, here's a thousand flowers. And uh, Ashoka said, well, no, there was supposed to be a thousand times a billion times a trillion times, you know, whatever, right? Uh, you don't have 50 gajillion flowers. Where, where's the rest of my flowers? And they said, well, well, your highness, we, we've made our best efforts. We've made a good faith effort to go out there and honor your request for this is an impossible order. And they said, ah, ah, but I asked, you, you cannot say that it was an impossible order, because I am your king, and I have majestic magisterial powers, and you should go out there and you should commit yourself to the order unfailingly, un, 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 unflinchingly, and, 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 and if you fail on that, you have failed your king, and failure of your king is tantamount to treason, and therefore what Ashoka does is he personally cut, he personally, all right, not, not, he's not going to order his soldiers in here, right, it, it said, that he personally he whips out his machete, right, or whatever, he whips out his, his scimitar, his, his scythe, his, his scythe sword, and he personally goes through, he cuts the heads off each and every one of these 500 ministers individually. Imagine that, right? So after he's murdered 100 of his brothers and half-brothers, right, he goes out there and he cuts the, the 500 heads off of his ministers. Amongst these other depravities that Ashoka inflicts upon various people, he decides that he's going to sit down with his chief architect, as well as his his chief torturer in chief, right? The, the guy who's in charge of all the various prisons, who's responsible for ensuring that the prisons are maintained in a manner that is sufficiently terrifying to those who are actually uh, interred there in those facilities. And he, he, he comes to his torturer in chief, and he comes to his chief architect, and he says, he sits down with them, and they, they, they have this conference, and he says, 
my, my, my subjects, I, I, I wish for you to go out and I wish for you to design and create and build and construct a, 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 a palatial estate which aesthetically and the, in the external, in the exterior, looks as though it is a palatial estate, but in the interior, it contains the most terrible, most degenerate, most despicable, most, most horrific torture devices that you could possibly imagine that are known to men. So it's, it's a way of deceiving, right? It's, it's, a, it's an act of deception. Go out there and create this, this magnificent, aesthetically beautiful, marvelous piece of architectural genius Externally, exterior, right? It, it looks like you know the Taj Mahal or St. Peter's Square or something, St. Peter's Basilica. Externally, from the outside, but when you go in, as soon as you go in, the, the door is open and it's dark, and there's you know, some lava brewing over there, right? And there's a, a rack over there, and there's some chains, and there's some handcuffs, and there's this guy over there wearing a mask, and he's got little eyes slits in, and you think it's oh, you know, in the name of the law, I'm gonna run out of here, but, but then it's too late, and that was the whole point. This 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 this, this construction, this diabolical edifice that Ashoka orders built is known, comes to be known as Ashoka's Hell. Okay, Ashoka's Hell. Imagine that. They refer to it as Ashoka's Hell. Good, good, good name for it. And the idea is, well, it's like, it's like what do they call this on Tinder? Uh, catfishing, right? You know, it's like me going out there and taking a picture of John Cena or something, right? Or Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, right? I, I don't know who, who, who handsome guys are. Uh, it, uh, gladiator. It's like me taking a, a picture of Russell Crowe, right? And then using that as my Tinder picture, right? And then you know, some some girl hits me up on Tinder, gives me her number, and we meet up at the you know the, the fish market up there at the top of Hancock Hill, and, and I show up looking you know looking like a douchebag, right? She's like, "Where's where's Russell Crowe?" Well, that's catfish. Um, that's what Ashok is doing with the show as hell. Maybe he thought it was funny. I don't know. I, mean, I guess he had a rather twisted perverse sense of humor, kind of like the Marquis de Sade, right? For those of you who have studied French history, uh, the Marquis de Sade, the Marquis de Sade was the, the, the reason they call people sadists, those who derive some, some twisted, perverse pleasure from inflicting pain upon others, they're referred to as sadists, because that's, that's the terminology that we use in, in, in psychoanalytical terms, uh, is, is because this guy, the Marquis de Sade, the French aristocrat in the 18th century, contemporaneous with the French Revolution, uh, was somebody who liked to torture people to death, and he, he got off, he got his rocks off on this, right? And that's what kind of like a show was, right? He was a sadist, okay? He enjoyed torture for its own sake, because he found it to be pleasurable to embrace the sufferings of, of his fellow man. This was something that he derived great intrinsic and possible perverse sexual gratification from. So he designs this hell, this Ashoka's hell, and it looks like the Taj Mahal from the exterior. It looks like, oh, they're living in this beautiful temple, right? And, and unsuspecting citizens of Ashoka, unsuspecting Marin imperial citizens, are walking by and they think that's us. Oh, look, look at that fine building over there. Let's go in there and have some tea, crumpets, right? And so they go in, and as soon as they open the door, it's dark, and it looks like, you know, the hostile movies or something in there, right? It looks like the Chainsaw Massacre, right? It looks like you're in rural West Virginia, and there's this guy's basement, and he's going to rape you all the live long day while he's cutting you up with, with his chainsaws. And that's what it looks like. And then you've got the, you know, the, the, the Marin Imperial version of the Chainsaw Massacre in there. And they're, it's said that they, 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 they melted down molten metals, bronze, iron, gold, whatever, and they would pour these metals over the people who were un unfortunate enough to actually walk into this Ashoka's Hell facility, uh, just, just, for the, just for the sake of doing it, right? And Ashoka would be there eating his popcorn or whatever, right, and, and watching this, and, and with his diabolical laughter enjoying it, and, and you know, deriving sadistic twisted pleasure and satisfaction from this whole process. And this was essentially the way that uh, Ashoka behaved himself for the first 35 years or so of his life, uh, in a very despicable and, and degenerate and uh, depraved manner. And, uh, and then Ashoka decides he's going to go to war with these people called the Kalenga. Okay, the Kalenga, and it's up here on the slide. And the Kalenga were another were a, a neighboring kingdom in modern day Orissa. And Orissa is in northeastern India. It, it abuts with, it is contiguous with modern day Burma or Myanmar, if those terms of things. Uh, it's in northeastern India, and it was a kingdom that had not yet been conquered by the Mauryan Empire. So Ashoka, being assertive, being aggressive, having absolutely no consideration for humanity whatsoever, decides to go out there and conquer this kingdom. And Ashoka, by the way, I should I should mention this. Ashoka is very good at conquering and subjugating people. He's he's very good at that, all right, because he's not in any way constrained with respects to what he believes he cannot cannot do in the context of warfare. This goes back originally to the arguments that were made 
Well, you're talking about Confucius, right? Confucius versus legalism, right? If you're a legalist and, and you embrace legalism comprehensively and, 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 and uh, transcendently, then you allow for it to modulate not just your interactions with individuals, but you allow for it to determine how you're going to comport yourself in international relations as well. I think that Ashoka was kind of like that. This also goes back to the, 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 the Thucydidean concept of might makes right, and if you're so powerful, well, then you're the one who actually sets the standards of what is just and what is unjust. And Ashoka was somebody who thought that, well, I'm going to fight war in as terrifying and as horrible a manner as possible, and I'm going to inflict as much depraved destruction and chaos and, and pain upon my enemy as possible in as quick amount of time as possible, in a short amount of time as possible, and therefore induce the enemy to submit themselves to my power, and thus save my life as well as saving theirs. That's actually a philosophy that comes from von Karsch. Uh, who was a 19th century military philosopher and uh, military general and military genius indeed, and that was his, his modus operandi, right? Go out there and fight the war as terrifyingly as you possibly can so as to induce your enemies to surrender, because otherwise if you fight the war with some restraint, well, the war is going to continue to perpetuate itself because it won't be so horrible so as to, so as to be unendurable, so as to be intolerable, and therefore it's going to perpetuate itself, and it's going to cause more and more deaths, and that's going to result in more human suffering. So better to go out there and just kill people as, 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 as aggressively as you possibly can, as viciously and violently as you possibly can, and, and to make it so intolerable as to compel and coerce your adversaries to submit themselves to your power and thus end the war as quickly as possible. Now, uh, that's just a broader point, and I think it relates tangentially to what we're talking about, at least intellectually, so I thought I'd bring it in here. Um, what Ashoka does is he goes out there and he decides to conquer these people in the, the, the Kalinga, is, is what they're called, the, the Kalinga, the kingdom of the Kalinga. And there's this massive battle. And it's said that 150,000 150, men lose their lives in the course of this battle. It's a very bloody battle. Uh, and understand, back in the day, and you know, this was, I don't know, uh, 1,700 years ago, battles were fought through interpersonal com combat, right? Through, through martial, physical, you know, direct physical combat, right? They weren't fought remotely. They weren't fought using drones or tanks or anything like that. So it was, it was through you know, physical hand-to-hand -hand combat. 150,000 men died in the battle. And it's also said that subsequent to the battle, 100,000 other non-combatants die as a result of the battle. Now that seems to suggest that, I mean, it doesn't come out and explicitly state this, right? But it suggests in my mind anyways that what they're really alluding to is that after Ashoka won the battle, which he did win the fight, right? It was a very brutal battle. It was a very costly battle too. It cost him many of his own soldiers to win this battle. After he won this battle, it, it, the, the sources seem to imply, again, they don't actually assert this, but they imply that Ashoka and his men went out there and just decided to engage in all manner of, of deplorable killing of civilians. Because that's who non combatants are, right? You're a non combatant, you're not a participant in the battle, right? You're somebody who has nothing to do with fighting. And Ashoka goes out there and just murders 100,000 people, right? Again, and this is, this is the, the Athenian, this is 5th century BC Athens, right? We do it because we can, right? We do it because we're powerful and there's nobody else to stop us. Well, so too would have said to show. Now, it's said that after the killing of 150,000 combatants, and on top of that, the surplusage, right, the, the gratuitous killing of 100,000 civilians, right, Ashoka wanders around the battlefield, right, uh, reveling in, in the death and destruction and the chaos that he's, he's murderously inflicted upon all these people. And instead of getting some twisted sexual gratification out of it, right, instead of laughing you know, with his maniacal sort of Saddam Hussein type laughter and, and reveling in the pleasure of the suffering of all these hundreds of thousands of people, he actually breaks down and he cries. And he's utterly destroyed as a man. He experiences, he experiences a terrible, terrible, terrible personal suffering and, and anguish, emotional and psychological anguish. And it, it's, it's, it's as though he suddenly has this this notion that there is such a thing as human suffering. There is such a thing as diabolical evil in this world. There is such a thing as a capacity to go out there and gratuitously inflict pain on people. And that he has been literally the embodiment of all those negative emotions and all those terrible effects that he has inflicted upon so many people since the beginning of his life. And he finally has this realization. And this is, as I say, a cathartic moment, meaning it is a transformative moment. It is Luke Skywalker at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, when 
Lord Vader reveals himself to actually be his father. Luke, you know this to be true. I am your father. That's a really weak Lord Vader. But that's essentially what Ashoka realizes. He doesn't realize that Lord Vader was his father, but he realizes that everything he's done up until now was really horrible and depraved and degenerate and despotic and despicable. Now, it seems to me to be absolutely incredible to live one's life to the ripe age of, you know, whatever, 38 years old, however old Ashoka is. I mean, I think, as, as uh, I think it was George Orwell who said, uh, a man has the face he has earned by the time he's 40. Right? You got the face you deserve, right? You deserve the face you wear by the time you're 40, right? That's not to say that, well, you deserve this face because you go out there and you got gotten old and you do look, you got gray beard hair like I got. Um, no, it means that you know who you are by the time you're 40, right? If you haven't figured that out yet, well, then you don't really know anything about anything at that point. Uh, I think, I mean, the same could be said of the show, right? He, he, I mean, I, I would say you kind of know who you are by the time you're in your 30s, for God's sake. Now, maybe it takes a, some of us a little longer. It took me a long time. I still don't know who I want to be. I want to be an airplane pilot. You can see how close I am to doing that. Um, so Ashoka has this cathartic realization. And he's walking amongst the, the, the hundreds of thousands of deceased soldiers and civilians. And he was the one who was the cause of all this. And he breaks down and he sobs. He sobs like a little bitch. He cries like a little bitch. And he realizes that this is, this is something that, that, that he was responsible for. And, and, and the magnitude of suffering. And the, the, the personal experience of all these other people. And how they experienced, how they, how, the, how they had to endure the gratuitous infliction of violence that he had been responsible for. And so he decides, it's, 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 like, it's like those people who are usually on death row, who discover, you know, they find Jesus, right? And I don't know what that phrase really entails, okay? You know, you've got this guy who's been sitting on death row for 15 years, and guess what? He, he has exhausted all of his appeals. The Supreme Court denied certiorari, they're not going to hear his case. And the governor is not going to give him any last minute, the 11th hour reprieve. And he knows he's going to the, he's, you know, you know he's going to the, death, the, the gas chamber or the, the, you know, the, the chair where they strap you on the chair and then just kind of barbell into your, your system, right? He knows that's coming around next week, right? And all of a sudden, miraculously, he has this religious epiphany. And, and it's a catharsis of sorts. It's a moral catharsis. And he, he, he finds Jesus. I always ask. I always ask the question. Well, there's two questions, right? First of all, where did you find Jesus, right? Was he was he under your bed in the cell, or was he hiding in the in the in the shower room? Somewhere? Where where was he? Okay, where, where did you find? Uh, and second of all, doesn't it seem implausible, impossibly con convenient for you that you just happen to find Jesus at the eleventh hour when you've been engaged in all that manner of depravity up until then? Okay, you've been sitting on death row and you've been trying to you know, rape the the, the the corrections officers that, that deliver your food. Okay, that's how diabolical you are, right? But ah, oh, yeah, the last night you took Jesus. Interesting. Now, now you could be doing that to to cleanse yourself morally, metaphysically, right? To to accept contrition, to hope for contrition and reconciliation, so that your 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 mortal soul, your immortal soul, is not imperiled. Uh, or you could be doing it just for the sake of appeasing the sensibilities of the to the people and hoping the the governor is going to be influenced by that. But that's a very cynical motive, obviously. Now, I think that Ashoka did something similar. Uh, I don't believe for one second that this was a genuine conversion. That, that Ashoka didn't, up until this point, didn't really understand that going out there and, and creating a, a diabolical, the most diabolical prison the world had ever seen, you know, essentially an Auschwitz-like torture chamber, a, a, a chamber of horrors, okay? Something like a, a real incarnation, right? a literal manifestation of Dante's Inferno. Uh, Dante was a, oh Christ, I don't know, a 13th, 15th century, 14th century poet and writer and Italian writer, and he wrote uh, this, this his, his great work was, was called The Inferno. And he talks about the various levels of hell, the different echelons of hell, the, the, ninth, the ninth circle of hell is the worst, that's where Saddam Hussein is down there getting raped by Satan. Uh, actually, Cicero is down there, Marcus Julius Cicero, and, and, and Marcus uh, uh, Junius Brutus is down there too, along with, uh, of course, the betrayer of Christ, um, whose name escapes me right now, Judas, Judas Iscariot is down there. Uh, well, that's that's kind of what you think about this way, right? If you're 35, you're 30, you're in your mid 30s, right? You're the ruler of a great majestic kingdom, okay? You're obviously an educated person. All the rulers of these these, these kingdoms were educated. And by the way, you have a, a Greek education because you have philosophers in your court. You have Greek philosophers, and Lucius and Cater, who came before you, right? Chandra Gupta and part of those guys. Too. So you know about philosophy. You know about humanism. You know about Stoicism. You know about Epicurean. You know about the, 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 the teachings of, of platonic wisdom, and yet 
You repudiate all these things consciously and, vo and volitionally, and very assertively, very emphatically, you repudiate all these things. Right? You go out there and you decide, I'm just going to kill and rape and murder and maraud my way across my empire. And not only that, inflicting this pain and suffering on your own people, your own ministers, your own brothers in the name of Allah. Okay, in the name of Allah, I don't know why I keep saying in the name of Allah. In the name of Buddha, right? Right? In the name of Buddha. B Buddha save me. Buddha save us all from the, the wrath of Ashoka. Now, I think it's, it's, it's insignificantly trivial, okay? I don't want to say it's completely meaningless. This, maybe some of you say, well, well, maybe, maybe it is a genuine catharsis, right? Maybe it is a genuine transformation. You shouldn't denigrate the guy who's trying to make himself better. It's self-improvement, after all, right? No matter under, under what guise it takes. Well, that's like saying, because Tom Cruise is a better person, or rather, because, because Tom Cruise says that Scientology makes him a better person, that therefore we should just vindicate Scientology of all the various depredations it has inflicted upon many of its members and its adherents, and that we should, we should not construe it as a cult, right? I, I don't think you can make that argument. I don't think it's a very persuasive or constructive or viable or, or intelligible argument. So, it seems to me that this catharsis, this transformation, this embracing of the teachings of Buddhist wisdom, and this transformation from, from, from going from this despotic, tyrannical, autocratic, dictatorial, degenerate, sadistic, Saddam Hussein-like figure, right, going from that to sort of a, a Pope Francis, right, uh, an early version of Mahat Gandhi or something of this nature, right, seems to me to be impossibly implausible. You couldn't convince me of this if you're, I don't know, Johnny Cochran couldn't convince me of this, okay? Clarence Darrow couldn't convince me of this. Atticus Finch couldn't convince me of this. The, the greatest lawyer, greatest legal mind of all time couldn't convince me of this. And I certainly can't convince myself of this. So I think that Ashoka is one of the greatest cynics of all time. But I, don't think, I also think he's very clever. He's very clever. Why do I say that? Well, after the destruction of the Kalinga, He's essentially consolidated his control over his empire. There's nobody, it's, it's like uh, Cyrus the Great, right? There's nobody left at home, right? Who, 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 in, this, in this movie, by the way, Gladiator. Uh, Gladiator, uh, Russell Crowe's character, Marcus, uh, uh, General Maximus Decimus Aurelius, he asks um, uh, the emperor, Marcus Aurelius, he asks him sort of rhetorically, he says, well, well who, who, who's left to who do we have left to conquer, sire? And Marcus Aurelius says, wistfully, he says, ah, oh, but there is always somebody left to conquer, Maximus. My, my dear, my dear son, he's actually not his son, but he's, he wishes he was his son. Uh, well, that's kind of the point that Ashoka got to, right? There's nobody left to conquer, I've nobody left to fight. And now it's time to focus internally on cultivating the love and the respect and the adoration and the adulation of people. Doesn't it seem just a little bit too convenient that that's the moment when you realize that, ah, time to wash my hands of all my depraved Saddam Hussein sadistic ways that I was engaged in before, torturing people, building up this this real-life version of Dante's Inferno, cutting MFers' heads off, killing all my brothers, etc. Time to wash my hands of that, right? Time to be like Pontius Pilate. Let's, let's wash the hands, right? Okay? Time to cleanse myself, right? Purify my soul, right? And become, come out the other end of the battlefield after I experienced, after I went and found Buddha hiding out there amongst the corpses that I was the, re I was the one who killed all those people, right? I, I found Buddha, right? I found, I like finding Christ in your, in your death sentence, in your uh, death row, and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, Pelican Bay or something, right? Well, I don't believe that for one second. How convenient. And why is it convenient? Because it serves his interest. It serves Ashoka's interest to then represent himself to his people as a man who's altruistic and caring and compassionate and giving and noble in his spirit and his outlook and his ethos. Because then he cultivates the love and the respect and the adulation of his people. And they're that much more deferential, that much more respectful. He doesn't have to worry about them revolting. Because if, they, if he keeps on going around cutting people's heads off, right, and just randomly killing people in his torture chamber, just for shits and gigs, because he can, because he thinks it's fun, right, you think that that's going to maintain the loyalty and the devotion of his subjects? Of course not. They're going to say, let's rise up and kill this douche, right, before he kills us, before he does away with all of us. Don't tell me that this is a genuine conversion. Don't tell me that Ashoka, as with the prisoner on death row, in, in, in upstate in Attica, New York, right? Or any of these other guys, right? Don't tell me that these people genuinely convert because they feel the, 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 the burning fire of Christ in their heart. 
And that motivates them to repudiate and renounce all their formerly diabolical ways. Oh, give me a break. Spare me, spare me the nonsense. Spare me all that tripe, okay? And I don't believe for a second that Ashoka neither should be. Furthermore, the fact that he went from the worst of the worst to essentially the best of the best, and I haven't told you why he's such a good guy. He comes out to be such a good guy at the end, right? But he does, right? Does that not add to the magnificence of this transformation? Does not not even impart greater glory unto him, who was formerly so twisted and perverse and, 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 and deplorable in his ways? But yet he's renounced all that. And now he's become a very generous, very congenial, very altruistic and loving and compassionate soul. Doesn't it make it seem all the more, well, miraculous, quite frankly? I would say, of course it does. And you know what religions need? They need miracles. Why do they need miracles? Because they need to persuade people that this is actually genuine. Now this seems to me to be the case for America. Buddhism, Buddhists, don't, Buddhists don't really believe in miracles, but it does add a greater degree of authenticity and veracity to the claim that Buddhism is in fact a genuine religion, right? Or it's a, a system of beliefs which has a genuinely transformative effect on you. Look, if it can take Saddam Hussein and turn him into Mother Teresa, right? If it take Ashoka, Ashoka, the diabolical Dante's Inferno, loving Ashoka, and turn him into Mahat Gandhi, right, after just walking around the battlefield, imagine what it could do for you, right? That's a pretty good sell. It sells itself, okay? I don't, you don't need me in here to sell that. Well, that, that's a pretty magnificent story. That's a pretty incredible story. It's too incredible. Too convenient and too incredible for it to genuinely be true. And that's where confirmation bias comes in, right? Confirmation, or rather, we, we, have, to, we have to subvert the possibility of confirmation. Or, 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 or renounce or, or, or remove the possible renounce the possibility of, of confirmation bias by not subscribing to this phantasmagorical proposition. All right. So after he converts, okay, after he converts converts to Buddhism, uh, Ashoka goes out there and he decides what he needs to do is he needs to he needs to proselytize the faith. He needs to go out there and spread the good word, not the good word of Christ, the Redeemer of souls. All right. He needs to go and spread the good word of Buddhism. Okay, that's what he needs to go do. And he decides that the, the Maran Empire henceforth is going to be officially a, a Buddhist state. And the Maran Empire is going to subsidize Buddhist temples. It's going to subsidize Buddhist missionaries that go out amongst the peoples of the earth and proselytize and bring with them the story of the Buddha and how this worked for our great king, our noble Ashoka. How it enabled him to transform his own life. So it can work for you too. Sounds like a sales pitch, right? Sounds like an unwelcome, an unwanted, scurrilous sales pitch to me. Well, that's essentially what it was. And he, he subsidizes the temples, but he does more than that. And this is the reason why, this is, I guess, why I suppose this is the argument in the other direction. This is the other side of the house, right? This is for those of you who are asserting that, well, actually, his conversion was genuine, it was authentic. Don't go out there and tell me that this is a disingenuous conversion, Jeff. No, you're you're besmirching the legacy of an honest and honorable man, right? Well, here's the other side of the house. Here's the other side of the house. He doesn't just become a good Buddhist, and he does become a good Buddhist, right? But his Buddhism is so his love for Buddhism, his embrace of this philosophy is so zealous and so pervasive that it permeates every aspect and every facet of his life and every facet of his capacity as a ruler of the Maran Empire. So what, what he does subsequently is he decides he's going to create free education. He's going to go out there and he's going to subsidize schools, create schools, public education. Public education was virtually unheard of at this particular time in history, okay? Unless you were extraordinarily wealthy, unless you were a member of the royal family or a member of the, the high echelon aristocracy, you didn't have a public education, right? No, none of these people had a public education, right? And so Ashoka decides, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to create public schools. Something that, again, was, was, was so enlightened in the context of this particular time and in this particular place especially. Nobody had thought of that before. Even Alexander hadn't even imagined that, right? It, maybe it, if Alexander had lived longer, he would have conceived of this, okay? But, but we shouldn't compare Alexander, who was a great man in his entire life, right, to somebody who, for the first 37 years of his existence, was essentially the equivalent of Saddam Hussein, Stalin, Adolf Hitler, Pol Pot, you know, and the worst megalomaniacal dictators you can think, a little Kim Jong-un thrown in there just for, for the hell of it, right? All blended together, right? The worst elements of all those guys, none of the good qualities, right? That's what Ashoka was, right, for 38 years of his life. 
Yeah, and, and that's the other point I think I should make, right? Should we say that, well, you know, let's 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 say on, on the level, right? Because he went out there and he funded schools and he proselytized Buddhism, which I think it is in and of itself, I mean, it is a good thing, right? The proselytization of the, the philosophy of, of Buddhism, okay, regardless of whether or not it's being done at the behest of Ashoka, right? Former Saddam Hussein, right? Uh, is a good thing in and of itself, right? And I, I don't think anything detracts from that. But can you say that because he did those things, that that completely cleanses or purifies or vindicates, if you will, his legacy to posterity? Well, imagine this. If Adolf Hitler, near the end of his days, decided, I'm going to embrace you know, Scientology, well, that would be a stupid thing. I'm going to embrace, you know, I don't know, uh, Anglicanism, all right? I'm going, to convert, I'm going to join the Church of England, all right, 1944, all right, after the Battle of Stalingrad is lost, right? I'm going to join the Church of England, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to subsidize the Would that, would that, would that exculpate him from the, from response, from command responsibility over the German armed forces and all the various depredations that they inflicted upon the civilian populations of the countries they occupied? Would that exculpate him morally or legally or ethically from the, the responsibility that he would have in, in implementing and facilitating the Holocaust? The answer is, of course it wouldn't. All right? You're still guilty for what you did. I go out there and I murder somebody and ask for God's forgiveness. Does that exculpate me from, from, from legal responsibility? Absolutely not. It has absolutely nothing to do with that whatsoever. Right? It, one thing has nothing to do with the other. They're, they're, they're non-overlapping magisteria, to use the words of Edmund Burke. Religion and, 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 and legal culpability, Re religious or moral responsibility, right? Moral accountability versus legal accountability. They're not overlapping magisteria. Now, uh, what else did what else did um, did, did Ashoka do? Well, he decided that he was going to go out there and he was going to promulgate a bunch of edicts, and these become known as the the, the edicts of Ashoka, the twenty four edicts of Ashoka. And Ashoka doesn't just like making up edicts, okay, just for the hell of it, right? But he likes going out there and building columns and big monuments and inscribing on giant stones his edicts. Sounds kind of like Hammurabi, okay? Now, the edicts weren't necessarily a legal code, but it was more an effort to codify the, the, the ethos of the morality of Buddhism, to codify, to make some sort of concrete, to concrete concretely express and articulate some of the more the more salient philosophical principles that are that emanate out of a Buddhist philosophy or a Buddhist perception of the world. And I think again this 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 in and of itself is a good thing, okay? But just because it's a good thing doesn't necessarily vindicate all the depraved things that the man who is doing this had done before, right? It doesn't it doesn't cleanse them. It doesn't purify you. Right? I, I and that's not to say that you can't you can't can't accept the or embrace the argument that if you do enough good, you can eventually outweigh the bad. I think that there is something to be said for that, right? But if you go out there and you do things that you really should have known at that point when you were doing them, that these are wrong, right? And if you tell me that Shoko, being educated, being an intelligent man, obviously a very intelligent man, very clever with this whole farcical conversion to Buddhism thing, right? Obviously, that suggests that he's a very shrewd guy. He's a very clever guy. And if he's that clever, all right, then of course you can't then retrospectively say, well, but he was so stupid, he was morally retarded for the first 38 years of his life, right? Literally, right? So morally retarded. He didn't know that going out there and killing and raping and maiming and torturing, oh, that was all fine and good, right? And, and it took him until he just wandered around this battlefield. It took him up until that point in time that he finally realized that was actually, oh, that's not such a good thing to be cutting people's heads off. Come on, okay? I'm sorry, that doesn't sell me, right? That, 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 that's a, that's a non-viable non proposition. It's a non sequitur for me. All right, uh, but he does go out there and he creates, he, he promulgates the, the four, 24 Edicts of Ashoka. And, and interestingly enough, amongst the Edicts of Ashoka, one of the things that are stipulated in, in well, several things are stipulated, is that we will renounce the caste system. All right, so we're going we're gonna to nullify, we're going to nullify the effects of the caste system. Even if you were a sudra, right, the lowest echelon, the, the lowest ranking member of the Walmart team, okay, we're going to say you are liberated from that position, all right? And even if you were a Brahmin, the highest echelon of the priests, right? We're gonna we're gonna liberate, well not liberate, but we're gonna we're gonna release you from that condition as well, right? There is no more caste system, there's no more demography as destiny. People can strive to aspire whatever they aspire to achieve, whatever the, whatever their talents and their innate gifts allow for them to achieve. 
right? So Ashoka tries to create a more meritocratic system. Again, I think that that is a worthy undertaking, right? That, 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 again, in and of itself, in isolation, right? If you view all these things in isolation, much of what he does is ipso facto good, right? But when reconciled with the, the, the former depravity of his life, right? I think on the balance, you say he's a pretty horrible guy, right? Uh, the, the fact that he did good things subsequently doesn't mean that you therefore are not no longer have any moral responsibility for the things that you previously did, right? That's just not the way it works. Because if that, if that was the way it worked, the people who go out there and murder other people would just be sentenced to community service, right? Go out there and do community service for the next 10 years, right? If you do enough, you do, you do enough adopt the highways and uh, big brother and big sister at the YMCA or something, right? Then you can cleanse yourself of the, you know, the, the, the terrible moral indignation that you would otherwise have indelibly for the murder that you committed many, many years ago, right? Well, that's not the way it is, right? Not to say that we would never allow for some expression of frustration, but I just think that's a part of the bargain. All right, the legacy of Ashoka. I got to go to the next slide here. And you, you look at this and you say, what, what's this? These are some rather incongruous items up here. And I agree, they are, right? So going from left to right, the, this, this thing here on the left is called the, the lion, the, the lion pillars of Ashoka, the, the, four, or the four lions of Ashoka. And it's meant to it's meant to symbolize different the, the four primal primary philosophical precepts of Buddhism. Now, don't ask me what they are. Uh, I, I know more about Islam than I know about Buddhism. Actually, I'm going to slowly exchange those. Uh, but Islam is actually in many ways more intelligible than Buddhism. It's not so esoteric as, as Buddhism. Uh, but these are the four pillars. This is the four lines the, or the lion column, the lion pillar of Ashoka. And on top of this on top of this column, on top of this pillar, is is what's known as Ashoka's wheel. And Ashoka's wheel has 24 spokes on it. You guys probably can't see this very well because I know the image quality is very poor. But it has 24 spokes radiating out from the center. Okay, 24 spokes. And I'm going to have to stop talking pretty soon here because I, I said I'd teach a, a political science class here after this. Um, and they're meant to represent the 24 edicts of Ashoka. Okay, 24 edicts of Ashoka. And then in the, in the middle of that uh, slide is the Maran dynasty, and this is just meant to show just how how effective Ashoka was at expanding the territorial size of the kingdom that he inherited from his predecessor. So he was he was he was he was a conqueror, but he was also he was many things, right? He was a sadist. He was a depraved, degenerate, maniacal dictator and, and tyrant, right? But he was also an enlightened philosopher, if you accept the, the Buddhist conversion rendition of things, right? I think you have to accept to some extent you have to accept it. And uh, the on the upper right hand corner of this image is the flag of modern day India. This is the actual flag of India since 1947 when they adopted it. And in the center of the flag of India, if you can see it, is guess what? It's the, the wheel. It's the, the Ashoka's wheel. Okay. And so they they still have, but the, the point that I'm trying to convey here is that there is still a lasting reverence for the legacy of Ashoka. Yet to this day, 1800 years after 1700 years after the fact, right? That the, the modern day people who occupy the Indian subcontinent still have such regard and reverence for Ashoka that they choose to honor him by superimposing his wheel, his representative metaphorical wheel, onto their flag, on the modern day flag of, of India, right? That would be like us having the, the face of George Washington in the middle of the United States flag. That, that sounds good, right? That's, that's a good proposition. I think we should go out there and advocate for that. Uh, bottom right, this is, this is another, uh, because I'm, I'm an aviation enthusiast, because as you guys know, if I could be anything other than uh, a, a history instructor or uh, an adjunct instructor of various things. I'd be an airline pilot or a lawyer, or I guess a lot of things, but probably an airline pilot because I, I love aviation and I like to talk about civil aviation. And because of that, I'm going to talk about it a little bit here. Uh, that, that is a 747, okay, a Boeing 747 200 series, which is a very early model 747. And that aircraft was actually an Air India plane, okay, Air India Flight 875, I can't remember the name, uh, the actual number, but. Uh, it was an Air India aircraft, and the, the aircraft itself, the 747, uh, was named after this guy, Ashoka. It was called Emperor Ashoka, right? And this was supposed to be the, the pride of the Air India fleet. Now, the, the irony is, okay, maybe it's not ironical when you think about just how despicable Ashoka lived his life, and then to go out there and name a uh, plane after a guy who lived the first you know, 35 years of his life until he was you know, the worst dictator you can possibly call him on. Uh, this, this plane actually ended up crashing in the Arabian Sea, so it, it ended up uh, flying out of, it was, it was an international airport, I think it was Mumbai, uh, off the west coast of India, right? 
So it's flying from the west coast of India to modern day Saudi Arabia or wherever, right? Well, I don't know why I'm saying modern day. It's not like that's an ancient plane. Um, this is back in the 70s. And the plane took off and took off at night and it took off over the Arabian Sea. And the Arabian Sea is very dark, especially at night. And the, the instrument that, that allows the pilots to determine whether or not the plane is flying, uh, what, what kind of pitch the plane is flying at, so what kind of angle it's flying at, was, was not functioning properly. Okay? And so they didn't know uh, how high their, their angle of attack was or whether or not indeed they were turning or they were banking. And so they, they, they lost perceptual awareness. And as a result of this, and because they couldn't differentiate between the horizon where the sea, where the ocean ended and where the sky began, that's very dangerous at night when you, when you lose uh, situational awareness and you don't have the capacity to differentiate where the horizon's at, especially when you're flying over a deep sea. Uh, they, they, lost, they lost that awareness, and, and due to spatial or disorientation, uh, the plane actually ended up crashing at you know, 500 miles an hour, or whatever it was, because it lost, lost, um, it, it lost, uh, it went into an aerodynamic stall in the last 10 seconds of the flight. Uh, ended up crashing into the, the Arabian Sea, and upon impact of the Arabian Sea, exploded, uh, and resulted in the death of everybody on board. So a rather, a rather sad ending to an otherwise glorious aircraft, uh, but in, in some ways, I, I think somewhat not ironic when you think about the legacy, the real legacy of Ashoka, right? The legacy of the pain, the suffering, and all the chaos, and the destruction, and the violence that was a result, a direct causal result of his living and his designs and his machinations and plans. So uh, I guess thus ended the lesson for today. Now I would just say, to reiterate what the point that I made very early on in this lecture, in case you guys weren't paying attention when I said this. If you don't think that this is going to work, okay, if you have a problem with the visual aspects of this and you can't really see what the hell is going on in these slides, I don't, th I don't think it really makes that big of a difference. Uh, but if that if that does make a difference, let me know, all right? Because I would be just as happy and probably happier than most of you to revert to the Moodle version of instruction, right? But if you think it's important to retain the visual aspect of, of communication, right? So that I'm actually sitting here in front of the camera as opposed to just talking, uh, just an audio recording. If you think that there there would be something that we lost in just an audio recording, and you think that this is valuable, let me know that too, all right? But either way, I, I, I want some feedback, okay? Because if you guys don't give me any feedback, I'm probably just going to go and revert to Moodle, all right? This is going to be the end of this, right? Because I didn't realize just how bad the image quality is here. Uh, and it, it, the whole point was coming here so that I could actually conspicuously display what was on the slides and you could visualize what was on the slides. You can't really do that very well. And I tried turning the lights off, by the way, before I started talking about this stuff two hours ago when I first came in here. Uh, I tried turning the lights off, but it made it even worse, okay? So that's that. Let me know about your feedback, guys. Uh, I should have taken the mouse and put it in here, but I got to get up and walk around here and get it. Um, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys are safe. And if I don't talk to you before, have a have a safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. All right. Think about think. Hopefully, you don't have any nightmares about a show health.